Well, good morning and welcome to City Hall. We're going to get started with the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Robbie Robertson is the pastor at Grace Place Baptist Church. He'll lead us in the invocation. I'll mention his son, Michael, is one of our firefighters at Station 18. One of our firefighters of the year uh, just a few years back. So congratulations on that son. And afterwards, I'll ask um, uh, Councilman uh, Pettit if he'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. But would everybody please stand? Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, this mayor, this uh, city council. Thank you as a citizen of this city, the blessing that I and my family have received as part of the work of those who serve on this council. I pray today for uh, them, for those who are in attendance here, Lord, that uh, you might give grace, might give uh, courage, might, I'd ask you today to would it be good today, Father, to ask you for the favor of God upon this meeting, upon these who serve? The psalmist said that, surely, O Lord, uh, you bless the righteous and you, you surround them with favor as with a shield. Would you give favor upon this council today? And Lord, would you grant wisdom? I'm reminded that the writer of the book of James says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask. That you give it liberally and you don't upbraid for those who ask. So I pray today you might grant divine wisdom and divine favor. I ask it in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. The Rotary Club of Oklahoma City helps us recognize one teacher in the Oklahoma City area that is our Teacher of the Month. And our winner this month is Courtney Ruby of Western Heights Public Schools. She's here. Come on up, Courtney. Let's show our appreciation and acknowledgement. We have a resolution. I'll ask the clerk to read it. Whereas Courtney Ruby has been named Teacher of the Month for May 2015 by Western Heights Public Schools and Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. Whereas Courtney has been teaching for five years, the last four at Western Heights Greenvale Elementary teaching first grade. Whereas Courtney earned a Bachelor of Science degree in elementary education from Southern Nazarene University in 2010. On a mission trip to help educate Jamaican children influenced Courtney's decision to become a teacher. The children there taught her that building trust and providing a place of safety is, an, is as important as learning the letters of the alphabet. Whereas Courtney believes that developing trusting relationships with her students is paramount, and it, and it allows her to teach them the skills needed to grow into intelligent, thoughtful adults equipped to pursue their goals and dreams. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the mayor and council of the city of Oklahoma City that they do hereby recognize and commend Courtney Ruby on her selection as May 2015 Teacher of the Month by Western Heights Public Schools and Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. Is there a motion? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. <laughs> what do you know? Congratulations. Um, well, thank you guys for voting. That's very kind of you. I have always wanted to be a teacher my entire life, and so I never, ever thought that I would win Greenville Teacher of the Year and then District Teacher of the Year, and now to be rec recognized like this, it is such a confirmation that I am doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. She teaches first grade in Western Heights. Thank you very much, Brittany. Thank you. It is also uh, one of those times when we're going to honor one of our Employee of the Month in the South Oklahoma City Kiwanis Club helps us do that. Keep in mind, 
we have over 4,000 employees working for Oklahoma City. So if you're the only one chosen, that's a pretty good deal. And this morning, we're going to honor Betty Johnson from the Utilities Department. Betty, come on up. <laughs> Betty works for the Water Department, and it's her job to make sure that 200,000 bills go out every month. That's a lot of bills. I, didn't, I can't believe we have that many customers to the water department. We do. We have a resolution. I'll ask the clerk to read it. Whereas Betty Johnson has been a city employee for 24 years and five months and is a unit operations leader on the SAP application support team in the administration division of the utilities department. Whereas Betty serves as the lead system support person for the SAP utility billing and user training as well as the IT and end users contact for billing functions. Whereas Betty maintains billing master data to ensure service rates follow approved rate schedules, conducts and analyzes test data, solves problems, and provides quality assurance. Whereas Betty assists the CIS business systems lead with application operations and maintenance of batch and interface processes, and is often called upon by utilities upper management to provide support for high level projects. Whereas Betty, known as the SAP Billing Guru, performs her job at an expert level as a result of the knowledge and experience she has gained from her years of service with the city. Whereas Betty is always friendly, willing to help others and share her expertise, her coworkers depend on her for daily support and guidance. Whereas Betty Johnson is a great role model, she respects everyone, is flexible, professional, courteous, and has great leadership skills. Whereas this council desires to recognize Betty Johnson for her dedication, professionalism, and commitment to Oklahoma City residents. Now therefore be it resolved by the mayor and council of the city of Oklahoma City that they do hereby thank and commend Betty Johnson, May 2015, South Oklahoma City Qantas Club Employee of the Month. How about a motion here? All right, second. And it is unanimous again. Let's show our appreciation. Thank you, thank you. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank the city of Oklahoma City because I've been able to grow and advance and uh, really make a lot of uh, advancement here in the city. And also I wanted to acknowledge the SAP application support team because it takes a village to get all those bills out. So I want to acknowledge all of our team. We've got a cheering section here for Betty. Here you go, Betty. You keep, Betty, you keep this. You bet. You bet. Uh, 200,000 bills a month. That is, a, that is an, a, an amazing task. Congratulations. And Betty also told me she's lived her whole life in Oklahoma City, a graduate of John Marshall High School, and, and uh, obviously you've, you've uh, had a great education along the way. Thank you for having, as the resolution said, an always friendly personality. That's a lot of pressure on you, though, Betty. <laughs> Thank you again. Let's see. Up next... We have some young men that have come to us from Heritage Hall. They have won the 2015 Class 3A Boys State Championship. Come on up with their coaches and line up here. Let's show our congratulations to Heritage Hall. We have a resolution. I'll ask the clerk to read it. So listen up, guys. Whereas the Heritage Hall basketball team defeated Vertigree 71 to 60 to claim its first Class 3A Boys State Championship. And whereas the Chargers, with a balanced offense and tenacious defense, finished the season with a record of 22 wins and six losses. Whereas the team made it to the title game by defeating Marlowe 61 to 41 and Atoka 72 to 67. Whereas Chris Hamilton II was named the Class 3A Tournament MVP after recovering from a broken ankle suffered in the preseason. Chris led the team in scoring, rebounds, and assists in the championship game. Whereas Chris was also named to the all-tournament team alongside teammate Callan Woodson. Whereas the city of Oklahoma City is well represented with the Heritage Hall Chargers head coach Chris Hamilton is also the recreation manager for the city's parks department. And whereas in 2014, Coach Hamilton took the Chargers to their first state tournament appearance in more than three decades. 
In 2015, his fifth season as head coach, his team won the Class 3A state title, and Coach Hamilton was named the Oklahoma's Little All-City Coach of the Year. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Mayor and Council of the City of Oklahoma City that they do hereby congratulate Heritage Hall on winning the 2015 Class 3A Boys State Basketball Championship. Congratulations, guys. Let's show our appreciation here. Um, and, uh, um, and as the resolution mentioned, Chris is a favorite here at City Hall because he is a manager in our recreation department. So um, Chris starts his day very early and then goes over to Heritage Hall where he coaches the boys' basketball team and obviously does a pretty good job over there too. Chris, I'm going to hand you the microphone. I'm going to congratulate these young men uh, personally. Well, I'll first say it is indeed an honor to be present here. Uh, this team has made a lot of sacrifices, and it couldn't be possible without me having the best assistant coaches in the world, in Rod Kendrick, Eric Gill, and Dylan Sullivan. They carry a lot of the load because they know that I am a very busy man. But I'm just thankful to God and honored uh, to be present today. Uh, did we vote on this? Okay, I guess that was a little premature. How about a motion then? And a second? And it passes unanimously. Now, one more round of applause for the All right, we are on page one of the council agenda. I'll look for a motion on the appointments, item 3D through G. All right, cast your votes, passes unanimously. And then I have been asked to um, go up and help lobby Congress next week for transportation week in Washington, but I will need a resolution to cover my travel expenses on that overnight trip. Uh, so item 3H, we have a motion and a second, cast your votes, and it passes unanimously. Item 4 is a journal of council proceedings. Item 4A is to receive the journal for April 28th. And item 4B is to approve the journal for April 21st. Any comments or questions on the journal? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And then item 5 is request for uncontested continuances. Mayor, <clears throat> several on page 10, uh, starting on item 9D1A. 1615 Northeast 23rd Street, we have to be stricken. We need to rework that as property maintenance. Item B, 2542 Northwest 23rd Street, we have to be stricken. The owner has removed. And item E, 3300 Southwest 51st Street, we have to be stricken. The owner has removed. Moving to item 9E1, item C, 1419 East Park, we have to be stricken. We need to re-notify. And item E, 3745 Northwest 11th Street, we that that be stricken. The owner has secured. And then moving on to item 9F1, item C, 1419 East Park, we that that be stricken. We need to re-notify. Item E, 3745 Northwest 11th Street, we that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item H, 1615 Northeast 23rd Street, we that that be stricken. We will rework that as a property maintenance issue. And then finally, item I, 2542 Northeast 23rd Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has removed. All right, any other requests for uncontested continuances? We'll move on to item six. These are revocable permits. We have a couple of people that have come to speak on behalf of their association and event. Our first is item 6A1. It's a request from the 39th Street District Association 
to hold the 39th Street Jazzy Fest on May 16th. And Ginger McGovern is here. Ginger, come on up. morning, Ginger. We'll need each of you to give us your name and address for the record. Okay, my name is Ginger McGovern, address 1141 Northwest 32nd Street, Oklahoma City, and this is Craig Poos, our president of the association. Right. And I'm 1609 Northwest 46th Street. Thank you. And tell us about your event. Well, the event, uh, 39th Street is one of the newer members of the family of districts, facilitated a couple years ago through town hall meetings with Councilman Shadid. Uh, Jazzy Fest is our attempt to embrace not only the diversity that's there on 39th Street, but the historical significance of Route 66 through that area. We're going to have a custom motorcycle show, two stages, you'll have to forgive me, I'm incredibly nervous. <laughs> two stages featuring all genres of music, uh, food trucks, merchandise vendors, vendors. Uh, kids, zone. kids zone with the giant Jenga, bouncy houses. Oklahoma Children's Theater. Uh, Lyric is doing Oklahoma Interactive to get the children interacting with the characters of the play Oklahoma. What else? I think that's about it. All right. Okay, we'll so call it's coming it up on Saturday, it. May 16th. Yes. 11 o'clock. What, what, what time? 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. All right. Ed, you want to make a motion on Great this? Job. I move for approval. All right. <laughs> Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Good luck on your event. Thank you so much. Huh? Next item, 6A2, is a request from Kaiser's Diner, LLC, to hold Kaiser's Classic on May 23rd. And, of course, Kaiser's is a staple of Midtown, and Kristen Corey is here. Kristen, good morning. Good morning. We'll Kristen need your Corey. name and address for the record, please. Okay, 3205 Northwest 34th Street. Uh, we are wanting to do <clears throat> a classic car and motorcycle show at Kaiser's. Um, we have requested to close some streets down, um, which we have gotten approval. Um, by all of our surrounding companies, St. Anthony's, EMSA, and then the man that owns the buildings next to us. Um, we are going to be serving food out of our building, um, as well as ice cream. Um, and then that's basically it. We're going to start 8 a.m. in the morning. It's going to end and be cleaned up by 4, Saturday, May 23rd. All right, so that's also on a Saturday. Meg, this is in Ward 6. It is, and I did note that you were going to keep the parking lot to St. Anthony open along on Walker. Yes. So there will be good access to Yeah, their to the outpatient hospital. entrances will be open. Perfect. Great. Yeah. I'd make a motion to approve. All right, we have a motion and a second. We're voting on item 6A2. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Thanks and good luck. Thank you. All right, we'll recess the council meeting convened as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. There are five items today. All right, comments or questions on the MFA? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. We'll recess the council meeting Convene as the... No, we're not going to recess the council meeting. We'll just adjourn the OCMFA and convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority, where there are three items. All right, comments or questions on the PPA? Cast your votes, then. It passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCPPA, convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. Mayor, this morning we have a presentation on the, on the EAT regarding some uh, surveying and some potential changes. Uh, in it, Marsha, do you want to introduce your, your, your consultants this morning? Marsha Slaughter. Hello. Good morning, Mayor and Council. With us today, we have representatives from SCS Aquaterra and Cole Hargraves and Snodgrass who are working with us to develop options for future uh, solid waste collection services. Uh, this is a part of, as it was 12, 13 years ago, uh, uh, rebidding our, service, our external service provision contracts for solid waste. We'll begin with Bob Gardner from SCS. Bob Gardner, he's the lead consulting engineer, and go to Pat McFerrin. Thank you. Mayor, council members, good morning. Uh, back in the end of December, you retained us to begin this study to look at the potential service levels that you provide your residents. And so we initiated that project in early January. And our primary focus, one of our major objectives, is to develop requests for proposals for new collection contracts associated with your municipal solid waste collection and recycling, your uh, maintenance, fleet maintenance facilities and operations, and also a potential long term for your uh, potential transfer station that might be cited for the city to serve you. In the process of doing this work, we have initiated several parallel activities. We're doing our engineering studies associated with looking at the alternatives, 
and at the same time developing the request for proposal. And so we're, we're moving at a very fast rate in order to get this particular RFP on the collections contract issued in May uh, later this month. So uh, it's been a very busy season. We've met with your existing uh, private collection hauler, waste management, to get their input. We've also uh, had discussions and meetings with other haulers in the region uh, in terms of to get their interest and to get their input with regards to specific issues that we might want to address in the request for proposal. We've also met with the waste management recycling folks with Batliner in order to get their input as well. And so it's been a, a busy season over the last couple of months. And so what we want to do this morning is a couple of things. Uh, number one is that we want to take a look at the uh, survey results first and then talk a little bit about the results of those, those surveys and look at the op options that we're considering including in the request for proposal and, and get some input from you if you have some at this particular time. So Pat, I think one of the more interesting parts is we've done a two-part public survey where we sent, uh, had a, a series of telephone interviews that we did with a select group of citizens and then we had a, a actual public focus groups that we met with in order to get their input on the services that are provided by the city and what they might like to see in the future. So Pat. Thank you. Uh, well, the survey was a telephone survey uh, that uh, was uh, randomly selected from the customers that you have. It was conducted in the middle of March, 600 interviews. I'll go through some of this very, very quickly. Reflective of the population set that we have here, it was done on landline and mobiles, and there's the income, some of the demographics there. Uh, there's the race. One of the things that we've seen consistently, have done some other studies here, uh, we continue to have 58% uh, that have visited the OKC.gov website. Uh, I've had been privileged to do these studies similar to this in a number of different communities across the region. And I will tell you the satisfaction level with trash service in Oklahoma City is, is uh, you know, uh, unmatched anywhere. Uh, pretty phenomenal. 93% say they're satisfied, 61% very satisfied. That's not what I see everywhere. And if at some point, I do have the DVDs of the focus groups. And the one thing I'd like to, I wish I could, I should have probably come out and shared with you guys. At the end, we asked them, if you could tell those that collect trash in Oklahoma City anything, anything at all, what you would tell them. The first response in both the groups was, thank you. Uh, I have never heard people talk. Uh, the only two other industries where I've had, doing focus groups where I've had people talk as highly and universally pleased are about firefighters and nurses. I mean, they exceeded teachers, uh, you know, quite frankly, in, in the, the, uh, the uh, uh, positive emotion they had about the uh, trash collectors. People talking about, uh, they come and check on me if I don't have my, my trash down. Uh, uh, just being very courteous, very, it was just, it was very, very impressive. Um, the um, other things you can see, they're pleased with the big blue carts, 91% there. I know that was an issue when we first started it, uh, but that's obviously been readily accepted by the residents. Uh, one of the, the, the two issues that we really had the focus groups concentrate on uh, was one about the use of bag disposal uh, and the possibility of getting rid of that aspect. Uh, you can see that most people very seldom use the, uh, the bag service at this time. From the focus groups, more than half of the people in the focus groups were not even aware that bag service was available. And almost to, and to a person, they all thought the bag service was already reserved solely for yard waste. Uh, and uh, it was very clear from the focus groups that, that getting rid of the bag service once if they were told they could get another cart, uh, even for, for a minimal charge, that it wouldn't interfere with the bulky uh, storm pickup, those type of things, uh, very, very readily ready to get rid of it. Um, in both the focus group and the survey, if we said, hey, would you pay for uh, the extra bag collection? Uh, if you maintain the bag collection, that was not readily accepted. Uh, so it really is, uh, uh, that they, they were more willing to pay for the extra cart than they were for bag service. Uh, high level satisfaction with the bulky waste pickup. Uh, there was a, a little, uh, it, it was interesting, the focus groups, those that are not in the areas, not uh, currently receiving the rural recycling, were the ones most likely to want the rural areas to be recycled. There was more pushback in those areas that are not being, currently having the recycles you can see here. You still have 51% in that area that would, that would like that to happen. Um, although whenever you went to uh, the cost, you can see that 62% of the rural customers would not be willing to pay anything extra to have that service. Uh, we saw, uh, this is still a high level of satisfaction at 71% for the 18 gallon bins and the recycling at this time. 
but it, it fails far below what we saw in excess of 90 percent on some of the other services that are provided. When we went to the focus groups, it became very clear very quickly why that is. It's Oklahoma wind. They don't like not having a lid. They think it leads to trash and litter and debris. Uh, and so I think uh, one of the things I would highly recommend from a, 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 a consumer customer perspective is at least going to a bin that has a lid, but it became readily acceptable that going to the larger carts for the recycling uh, was something that was readily, readily accepted, uh, especially when you put in the key thing. It was interesting. It's, uh, it's always fun when you, when you listen to residents and what they have to say, uh, but uh, we, we heard some very interesting theories about why cardboard wasn't collected. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, it was because the glue apparently has to be recycled off of it. We had a couple people tell us. But uh, the, uh, if we move to the big carts and collect the cardboard, automatic, very strong response in the focus groups. They want to recycle more. Oklahoma City residents want to recycle more. And they think moving to the bigger carts will allow that to happen. And, and if that does, even if it costs a couple of dollars more a month, if that's something that has to happen, uh, the focus groups and the study show that they're willing to do that. Um, some of this here. Uh, even without any discussion, we had a third wanting to move to the larger carts. Uh, and it's higher among those who recycle regularly. Uh, and you can see the, the yard waste in carts uh, we, it, it is accepted. Uh, and whenever it was talked about in the focus groups, it, it, the, anybody that was initially opposed very quickly came around to, yes, it would be just a lot cleaner, nicer for our neighborhood to move everything to carts. Uh, they are not willing to pay more for the yard waste collection, however, at this time. Uh, so that is uh, one of the concerns there. Uh, there is some movement for wanting to favor compost collection. Although, it's, you can see it's, it's uh, 68 to 21. There is a really strong age line there. I guess we didn't show that there. Those under 45, very willing to. Those over that age, not. And those over 65, opposed to it. Uh, and uh, I, so I think that's something that'll change. But I think it's probably 20 years or 10 or 20 years before there's more Oklahoma City residents wanting and willing to pay for it. You can see when it comes to paying for it, uh, there's not a, a strong willingness to have that. Uh, you do see that those under 45 are willing to, uh, but, uh, uh, but the nothing uh, among senior citizens, 75% say no for compost. So that's the, the survey and focus group data. And again, I can't reiterate, what you guys have done in the past has been, it, it, was, it was astonishing, the, the positive reaction when it came to something as trash service. I think a lot of people, I, I thought took it for granted, but they don't in Oklahoma City. One of the things that was pretty clear in the, in the public survey as well is when you asked how much do you pay for your services, most folks didn't know. And I, I, I suppose a lot of folks don't know. And a lot of folks really don't know the services that, that are available. So I thought it might be good to really quickly go through what that looks like for, the, for the, the city here. As you can see, the urban household, you get the two big carts, blue carts, uh, at no additional cost. And if you get a, an additional third, fourth cart, you got to pay extra for that. Uh, you get the bulky waste pickup once per month. You get the recycling in the 18-gallon bins once a month. And you have right now unlimited, in, in the urban areas of the city, unlimited bags set out. And that's become a kind of an issue. Um, and one of the things that kind of think in mind, you currently use both the city and the contractor, use automated collection vehicles, where they have the big arms, they come and they tip. Typically, you can, on most places, you can get between 1,000 and 1,200 households per uh, day on a given route. Uh, both the contract and the city are is somewhere in the eight, area of 825 to 850 per day, partly because you've got the bag set outs. People are having to get out of their, their vehicles, load the bag sometimes in the cart, and then re, redo it again. Uh, and so it just takes time. So in a normal pickup, if you ever watch them going down your street, nine seconds, one can, they're up and gone, and they're on their way. If you have bags set out, you're probably talking a minute to three minutes, or even more sometimes, if you've got 50 bags out there you know, to throw those bags. So that has a significant effect. It has a significant issue with re relative to your worker health and safety uh, when you're having to throw bags, and, and so there's issues associated with that. So in, in, in light of that, uh, we've, look, we've looked at a couple of different things uh, relative to both the urban area and the rural areas. And so in the rural areas, as you probably know, uh, there's no bag pickup provided. There's no recycling provided. So you essentially provide two services, your household residential pickup and your bulky waste pickup. And that's the primary services that are done in the rural areas. So uh, where, are we, where are we going from here? Uh, our ultimate goal is to advertise for the new collections request for proposal in May. 
Uh, you'll hopefully in the next two weeks be receiving the draft of the RFP for your approval to issue the RFP. The current contract uh, is over uh, August 31st of 2016, so they want to have at least a year period for transition uh, depending on who is ultimately selected and the types of service levels that are provided. So the goal is sometime in September, hopefully, uh, to, to bring the ultimate contract before you for, for approval. Uh, as I mentioned, we've had uh, significant discussions with the various private haulers in order to get their input. They're, they're a major a party in this particular uh, uh, service that is provided by the city, and so we, we thought it was important to get their input, and so we've met with each of those, as I, mo I mentioned earlier. So what are we, what are, where are we going in this request for proposal? Well, we're looking at a couple of things. For household collection, we're getting bids and proposals for the status quo. In other words, beginning uh, September 1st, 2016, no change. Just continue as you is, get new, new pricing. Uh, but also we're asking for pricing associated with changing that. So looking at uh, a bag limit as one option. In other words, have three to five bags. You can pick whatever number you want, but have a bag limit uh, that's associated with efficiency. Uh, and also a pay as you throw for additional bags. So you can go to a bag system where you can you know, buy bags in, at, at your uh, various retail areas that are already associated with the city and you can tell what they are and you can pick those up. Uh, bulky waste once per uh, month, no change there. Uh, I think the biggest other change is with recycling. Some of you may know that there is a, a, a movement abroad with, in the United States with regards to how recycling occurs. And so right now you, you have a system what is called dual stream recycling. They're in the 18 gallon bins and you, there's, it's source separated at the curb. With a single stream recycling, you have, again, usually use 96 gallon containers, and everything, all the recycled materials go in that container, and it's picked up by an automated vehicle, uh, more efficient in terms of collection, um, and then you bring it to a, a single stream processing facility. Oklahoma City is unique in that you have two uh, material, what they call material recovery facilities, recycling facilities, that are located right across the street from each other, Batliner and Waste Management. Uh, both of those would, if, if in the case of if they continue with single stream, uh, if they go to single stream waste management, would have to modify theirs if they were to do that. Batliners is a current single stream recycling facility and services various municipalities in the area. So that's a big change with regards to getting proposals for the dual stream, as is, and then single stream. And so in the proposal, we have phasing plans to allow for the initiation of the contract in 2016, and then over a year period, allow for that transition to occur depending on what the actual pricing is and whether it makes sense and whether you approve those particular changes. So that, that's really the, the big picture with respect to what, what this RFP is about. As I also mentioned, we have the fleet maintenance RFP, uh, which will be probably issued sometime in the late fall of this year. Uh, and then sometime in the, in the future, uh, und undetermined future, uh, a potential transfer station uh, RFP. Uh, so. That's the overview. Uh, if there's any questions or, uh, that you might have, I'd be willing to entertain uh, those questions. Okay. Yeah, Pete. I, I have a question, and, and may, it may be uh, something that Pat might uh, answer as well. It, it, it has to do with whether, at, at what point, uh, cities decide to go to this more robust uh, recycling thing. Is it something that uh, we, cities wait <coughs> to hear from the public and say we want it, or? Do the cities that have, uh, have, it, have it now, did they start it because they thought it was the right thing to do? Uh, the typical, there, there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, number, number one, um, for example, right now with dual stream with 18 gallons, one of the practical reasons why you don't typically recycle cardboard is there probably isn't enough space unless you get more 18 gallon bins in order to handle cardboard. I know from my personal, I have a 96 gallon where I live. I, you, know, you get deliveries from Amazon, so you get all this cardboard material, and you got to deal with it. That's one one issue. The second issue in terms in terms of participation rates, it's just easier when you have to put it into one place, and so you get more material right. that you can ultimately recycle. Uh, and so that's been the primary driver: is it, it increases participation and increases the, the amount of material that is ultimately diverted from the landfill. And those are the two primary ones, and, it, and it's pretty efficient from a collection perspective. You're not having to get out of your vehicle unload the material, get back into your vehicle and go, you just, just like you do for your normal blue, big blue carts, you tip it and you, and you go. Well, I, I know that there are other cities in the area that have a more robust recycling, recycling process than we do, and I was really trying to get at whether they waited until they heard from everybody and said, we want a more robust system, or they did it because they thought it was the right thing to do. 
I'm, and I thought maybe yeah, some of that may have come my, in here. My experience there is just a, a little limited, uh, but I know in Norman when they when they they first rolled it out, I think it was a leadership decision to do that. Mm -hmm. They then did have they did have to have a public vote on some of the costs associated right. with it because of the way their system is, and it was in, embraced by the citizens there. But, it, but it's, yeah, it, I think it's something that does generally take leadership on the issue. But I will tell you right now, from the, the survey data and the focus group data, the residents here are ready to move forward with something, especially for cardboard, uh, and that encourages more recycling and less landfill. Those are areas that they are very concerned about. Well, the little poll that I conduct every week based on who calls me and complains or, um, is that um, there's lots of people in rural areas that, that would really like recycling in the rural area and there's no one in the rural area that would pay for it. So. No, and I, this is, that, that's exactly what this said, for the rural area. And it's the, the people most wanting to pay for the rural area are those that don't live in the rural area. And that's, that, that's been my experience. That's exactly but what this But the said. compost piece of it, I mean, Norman has a really robust composting situation. And I'd like to see, as we go forward, perhaps we've done what we need to do for, for this RFP, but I'd like to see uh, an, an analysis of how that works. I mean, I. I can't imagine it being um, cost effective. I mean, it, it just, it's very difficult for me to believe it somehow pays for itself, but. Uh, it's, it's part, part of our study is to address that as well. Uh, and um, we, we've done, a, we're doing in the process right now of doing a benchmark study, which includes Norman, Midwest City, and, and Edmond, and, and a whole bunch of other areas, demographic similar to Oklahoma City. Uh, you're right, in terms of one of the unique things about Oklahoma City is the very low cost for landfill. Disposal. We had about seven, a little over seventeen dollars a ton at this juncture for MSW. That's really some of the cheapest landfill disposal rates in the nation. So it's very difficult if you want to go do additional things. And you made this decision back in the early two thousands for that reason: is that from a cost perspective, it made no sense. From if you wanted to make decisions based on some other factors, you might consider it. But it's going to be more more expensive than probably landfilling it. And there's some benefits because the various facilities that are landfilling have landfill gas recovery facilities. So there's, so there's some benefits in energy being re recovered from the material that's being disposed in the landfill as well. So that's a, something to consider as well. But, just, just a point of clarification. You're really talking about segregated green waste collection. Right. Yes. Then it would be, then it would be take, collected and then, they, the, the, then after it's out of your neighborhood, then it would be composted. But you're really talking about having separate bins to, to take green waste that could be, that could be right. used. Yeah, this the, is, uh, the, the, it's, what, I, what I'm talking about is really driven by a feeling that I have that um, we, have to do, we have to do everything we can to uh, reduce the amount of refuse going into the, to the landfills. I mean, they're, they're, they have a finite ability to continue to do that. And the next stage, when, if, if we don't find a way to dispose of it um, some more economical, environmentally safe way, uh, the cost of relocating a landfill is going to be uh, it's going to be terrible. I mean, it's going to be huge, and it's not just the cost of what it costs to buy the land to do it. It's the additional driving time, the wear and tear on the streets as you get out. We're, I think we're fortunate that we have them relatively centrally located, as opposed to our folks having to drive another 20 miles outside the city limits and dump them on dump the landfill waste on somebody else. So I'm, I'm just looking for a way to try to preserve the landfills we have as long as we can uh, because of what I see is a real horror story and when you have to try to locate one. Most definitely. Are, are there any projections of how, if going to the, to the 96 gallon, how long it would uh, lengthen the life of our landfills? We're in the process of, of, right now, you currently recycle about 9,000 tons a year. That's about 3% of your waste stream. It's pretty low if you look at a national averages. We're, we're, we're projecting you could probably double, triple, and quadruple the amount of material that you are uh, diverting through using a single stream recycling. Uh, so that could get up, upwards of 27, 35,000 tons. You currently dispose about 289,000 tons per year, to give you a, kind of a perspective on that so you can kind of do some quick math in your, your mind one of the unique things also for the the city is the, the private landfills that you use have projected lives that go 30 to 40 40 plus years out and so a, that small change of diverting going from three percent to 10 or 15 percent is pretty significant with respect to ultimately the extending the life of a landfill 
I, I just had a quick question. Um, in reading the memo, I was surprised, and maybe this is a common known fact, but I was surprised to see that recycling glass is a low to no value proposition. And that's Correct. the thing I feel best about. Isn't it funny? Yeah, uh, it, 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 sort it, of. <laughs> it, it, well, when I say funny, it, it, it's, it's counterintuitive in your mind, I guess is what you're talking about. And what it, what it is is that glass right now as a commodity has really no value. It's a cost to get rid of it. To, I mean, when you pull it out, there's just not a big market for the material. And also it breaks. And so when it's going through the process line, it contaminates various paper and, and your cardboard and different things. And so it's, 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 a, it's a problematic material uh, right at this juncture. The, the, yeah, I, I agree with you. It, it's something we all feel good about because it's the heaviest part of the recycling stream. And so you, but you just feel good about not putting that in a landfill. But really, from a value perspective and, and dollars, and that's what these recycling facilities work off of is, is the commodity value. Um, it has no value. And, and so at this juncture, and that, that can change. Uh, and one of the th interesting parts of the RFP is we're, we're inserting the issue of commodity value in the pricing. Uh, because right now, you're, the, when you're not paying anything going to the recycling facility, they're not, there's not a tip fee. But that's beginning to change throughout the country because of the, the low commodity prices that are currently in the recycling market. Uh, because when China in, in, implemented what was called the, the, the green fence, it basically established some real strong criteria for recycling materials, which then forced processors, either they couldn't sell it overseas, or they had to in install additional processing in order to clean it up, which means it costs more. So, for example, I think Dallas just got a bid for processing of, the, of the, uh, their, their, mer their recyclable materials, or before it was zero. Um, so that's a significant deal, and, and I agree with you. It, it kinda, you kind of go, why, why is that? <laughs> but that's why. Yeah. And, I think many cities, including I think most recently Dallas, are either restricting or studying restricting plastic bag usage. Did you explore where the population might be, or is that outside the scope? It's outside the scope, but uh, in terms of commentary, actually plastic bags in, in a lot of refi recycling facilities has got some value in terms of the, 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 the materials, and, and they bale it, and it's, it's petroleum product, and so they can, they can get some value out of it. Um, but no, not a part of this study. We looked at uh, banning bags. Yeah, I will mention in the, the now it's granted it's focus group, 24 citizens, two different groups. We did have two people mentioned out of the 24 that they, they, one of the reasons they wanted to go to the cartage instead of the bags was to eliminate the use of plastic bags. And that will be a benefit. One of the things with the carts would, would be, because what's interesting on the, on the and it, it is a problem from the recycling facility, it, it creates all kinds of havoc in, in, in the processing line. Because what happens is, and maybe some of, I've done it, where, where you get your newspaper and you have a plastic bag, you just go and destroy it, and you put all your newspaper that you're, you want to recycle in the plastic bag, and you take it out to your 18-gallon bin, and then, you, and then they take it. And when it comes to the recycling facility, <laughs> they've got to deal with that because it gets wrapped around the various parts of the machines and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's a really interesting conundrum. Uh, and so going to the, 18, to the bigger cart, you would potentially eliminate that particular challenge. I think the impact of the plastic bags is more the litter problem than it is the recycling problem. I mean, if you look around what you see around any of these big box stores, you could spend your rest of your life picking up the bags, and it, you know, I think they're more, much more of a litter of, of, of a public appearance thing than they are a recycling thing to me. I mean, the impact on the public is much more the, that. Anybody else? Mayor, just want to point out that, that the, uh, it shouldn't be a surprise of Pat's numbers on, uh, on the uh, satisfaction with customer service because that's reflected every year in our annual survey. His numbers go very hand in hand. And I don't think there's a, a, a division in the city that has uh, penetrated the organization more with the culture of customer service than solid waste has. And I think part of that, a big part of that is because Jim Lynn, and Jim Lynn's here, stand up Jim is here today, and, and Jim has really brought a culture of, 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 first of all, Jim has a passion for what he does, but he's brought a culture of customer service that's penetrated all the way through the organization. And I, and I think a, a lot of the fact that our numbers are so high I attribute to, to Jim's uh, uh, cultural change out of that organization. So, I want to recognize Jim. All right. Jim, thanks. Thank you. You bet. Thanks, guys. Well, ready to vote the EAT? Do we have a motion and a second on this? We need a motion. Yes. Cast your votes. Passage unanimously. 
will adjourn the OCEAT and reconvene the council meeting with the consent docket. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any individual considerations on the consent docket? Mayor, I did, if I could uh, please uh, mention 7V. V is in Victor. V is in Victor and uh, W as in water or waste. All right, Meg, go ahead with item V. Um, 7V is um, city manager, the relocation of some of our employees for a minute out of one yes. North Walker into 500. Yes. yes. And um, I wondered as they move back into the ground floor specifically, yes. if we've had any discussion about um, activating that corner a little bit. You know, currently the windows are all blocked off, the, you know, we're in a parking garage space. Am I in the right space? Okay, what we're doing is taking the, the, uh, the personnel has moved over into, into, into the, the one North Walker building, mm -hmm. and they're moving out now to the space up at 500, and water is, is now moving into, that, into that, that space. And so what you're saying is can we do some things to activate the windows in the one North Walker space? That's something we can certainly look at as we I go just, forward. We're working on everybody else to kind of create some street activity. It would be nice if we could do it in our own space. And um, 7W, I just wanted to compliment Mark Cranenberg uh, for getting us direct service uh, from Oklahoma City to Seattle. I think they'll be very successful, and uh, congratulations. Thank you. We've been working on Seattle for a long time, and, and just to refresh your memory, it is a, uh, one of the larger regional jets. Uh, it'll have 76 seats, and it'll have first class and regular cabin service, and uh, it'll be start off with uh, one daily flight. And, and the bookings have been very, very good from what we hear from Alaska, but thank you. Anybody else on the consent docket? All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. We're on to the concurrence docket. Can I speak to uh, 8B, please? B? Yeah, Mark, go ahead, item 8B. I am really excited about this resolution, um, Paycom software. Uh, this the resolution has the potential of creating 423 new jobs over the next two years at an average annual wage of $51,000 plus. Um, Paycom has been here for 16 years. Uh, they are willing to invest in Oklahoma City by spending $16 million in a new building uh, and with equipment. And so I want to thank their board of directors, uh, their management, their employees, and I also want to thank city staff and the chamber that helped bring this resolution to us. Any other comments or questions on the concurrence docket? How about a motion on that docket as a whole? Move the item. Is there a second? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. On item nine, these are items that require a separate vote. We'll start with a series of zoning cases. First is in Ward 2. It's at 7105 North May Avenue. It's currently R1 single family and a C3 community commercial district and it would be all placed into a new simplified plan unit development if approved. Ed, we have one person who has signed up to speak. That's a, there's, a, you have a protester? Doesn't that, say. Okay, well, let's hear from them first. Okay, Barbara Rowe. Good morning, Barbara. We will need your name and address for the record. Barbara Rowe, 7601 Northwest 38th in Woodlawn Park. Okay and I own the home at 2916 Northwest 71st. And um, my family has owned that home since, well, I was born in that home and my mother died in that home and then I purchased the home from the other siblings. And my niece now lives in that home. So I have a great interest in that neighborhood and I've watched it um, develop and um, have bad times as well as when the businesses began going in on May Avenue. It increased traffic, it um, proposed safety issues, the house next to me has a small child who rides a bike and constantly there are cars coming out onto the 71st entrance into their business that they back up, they drive rapidly to I guess check the engines that they work on up and down the street and they have for decades and my mother has always called for help and she's always been pleased with the individual she's spoken with but nothing ever gets resolved as far as the business. Um, you know, I think that 
now Oklahoma City really looks at planning and does a lot better job than um, at times, I think. And um, some of my concerns are the property values continue to go down. Um, the house at 2908, I'm concerned being purchased by Dent Depot. I hear it's still a residential, but I don't want it zoned to a business, and that would be the house that's adjacent to the body shop. Um, you know, I think in pre-planning now, you may have built a cul-de-sac on that street so that the body shop could not run cars down 71st Street would have been a good resolution when it went in. Um, I'm glad that they're very successful, that their business is ex increasing, that they want to expand services, but I think that it might be time for Dent Depot to move to a more commercialized area and away from residential housing, and maybe a smaller business could go in that shop and, and get a, a start there. So I'm against the, the expansion, and um, that's all I have to say. All right. Thanks for coming down. Can, can we hear from David? Mr. Mayor, members of council, David Box, 522 Call Corp Drive, here on behalf of the applicant, Mike Dennison, who's also with me here today. Uh, as a bit of a history, um, this particular site has been used for this use uh, somewhere around 15 years. Uh, recently, my client was approached by the fire marshal's office and told that his paint booth needed a fire suppression system. So we then went through the process of installing that at a cost of around $12,000. Once he was done with the installation and he went to pull his permit, the uh, city staff notified him that he wasn't zoned correctly. So what we've done is we have filed a very limited spud on a piece of property that currently is zoned straight, straight C3. <clears throat> we only allow 13 uses in this spud. As this council knows, straight C3 would allow an unlimited number of uses, somewhere around 60 uses, most of which, being commercial, are geared towards generating high volume of traffic. When you look at the 13 uses that we propose, all of which will be limited traffic. There was a protest letter that was submitted, so I do want to address some of the issues in there because they deal with uh, environmental issues. <clears throat> the letter states that acid is used in the process. Uh, confirm with my client that he doesn't use acid in the process. He did have the uh, state DEQ office out um, in 2012. It was an unannounced visit, and what they found was uh, that there were no emissions. We meet all federal and state regulations for these types of facilities. In fact, my client's paint booth um, reduces the emissions by 98.7 percent. State law is 85 percent. And if you can envision this, this facility, the paint booth is a self-enclosed booth within the garage. And when you go, it is a self-contained unit, a brand new fire suppression system on it. Um, it's, it's, it's one that uh, meets all standards for the state, the city, and federal regulations. Next, uh, the discussion in the letter about cited for too many cars. Uh, my client has not been cited for too many cars. Part of this SPUD will require that all cars be kept on site. Uh, we did spend a significant amount of time with both city staff and uh, Ms. Powers, the War II Planning Commissioner, on site meeting, trying to figure out what was best. And what we came up with was a, a limited spud with a lot of involvement from a lot of folks. That staff ultimately recommended approval. Uh, planning Commission also uh, unanimously recommended approval. So what we have, what we believe, is something that will really long term provide for much more limited, much more responsible development along May Avenue. Uh, you can see in the image before you our intrusion into the neighborhood is much less than most of the C3 that, that is common up and down May Avenue. We actually go not as far west as the spud to the south, and then as you go further south, the C3 extends much further to the west. Uh, so with that, we did agree to the technical valuations, and we would ask for your approval. Can you speak to her concern that, I mean, you are in a very tight space. There is, does seem to be a lot of business. There's a lot of cars on site. Her concern that you might be looking at purchasing residences and expanding. Th that is not on the table. What happened initially, there was an error, I believe, in the, uh, the staff report. The, uh, what you look at now, the initial thing that got sent out, that red dotted line actually encompassed the home to the west. 
Um, that was never on the table. I believe it was just a, a mapping error. Uh, so no, uh, the only thing before you is, is the actual body shop, the site we've got right now. But would you see a potential for expansion in the future? Uh, I couldn't speak to that. I, no. no. So um, at the time the Planning Commission heard it, there was no protest. They asked for the fire marshal to come, and I, I think that didn't happen for whatever reason. I talked to Janice Powers, the Planning Commissioner. She spent an hour, hour and a half on site, and she's comfortable with, with the environmental. This is activity. It does seem fairly industrial, but it has, it's been going on apparently safely for 15 years. So uh, as long as you don't ask for an emergency, I'll move for approval. No emergency. May I, may I ask a question yeah. before vote? Uh, David, what kind of a buffer are you providing between the shop and the residents, uh, the resident ex you know, to the west? Sure. Uh, currently, there is a fence uh, that runs that, that western uh, border, and the elevation change is such that um, our site is actually much higher. And so when you're standing in the front yard of that home to the west, it appears to almost be a 10-foot a uh, fence, whereas it's, it's, I think it's a 6 to 8-foot on our site, but the elevation is such that it provides additional height. What kind of fence is it? It's a stockade fence. What about this lady's concern about the vehicles driving up and down 71st Street. Yeah, I, I asked my client, and uh, he is not aware of that, but he is certainly going to advise staff, his staff, that that, that is not okay and, and encourage them that you can't do that. David, other questions? Yes, thank you. Um, David, are you familiar, what is um, the SPUD 644 to the south? Do you know what that? I do not know what that is. I believe that is the, uh, the dog kennel that came before a couple of years ago. Uh, there was a bit of controversy at the time. Um, now that I think about when I was out there, I did hear several dogs. So I believe <laughs> that is a dog kennel. And the corner, I can't read what that says. Tobacco shop. Tobacco shop. But you think that the Spud 644 is zone, I mean, there's some use that would be non-residential, I, mean, I guess I would say that. Yeah, it's the dog kennel, dog boarding, I think is what, okay. called it a doggy daycare. <laughs> Ed, you've made a motion to approve the zoning request. Is there a second? All right, cast your votes, passes unanimously. Thank you. Item 9B is a zoning case in Ward 1. The address is 3115 East Overholzer Drive. It's currently R1 single family residential, and it would become a new simplified plan unit development. If approved, it was denied at Planning Commission. Uh, James? We have three people that have signed up. Yeah, let's, uh, let's start with the applicant. We'll go to whoever's okay. signed up. Good morning, uh, Tim Johnson with Johnson & Associates, 1 East Sheridan Avenue, Oklahoma City. Here on behalf of the Boathouse Foundation as well as the uh, city owns the uh, underlying property, the uh, applicant of the zoning case is uh, the Boathouse Foundation, which is the uh, leaseholder on these, this tract of land. Um, just to give you a little background on uh, why I'm here and why we're here today with this spud is the uh, about a year ago, this process started with the Boathouse Foundation working with the Utilities Trust to develop a lease for a better utilization of this uh, existing facility, which included the bait shop and existing boat storage building, and the very southwest piece there was more or less a vacant tract of land. Uh, this is served by a little bridge on 31st Street that uh, has always served the area west and east of the canal there, west of Overhoser Drive. Um, the lease was approved by Water Trust in July of 2014 and uh, subsequently approved by the City Council, which included in that lease everything that's been proposed and done out there to date, including the big swing, the zip line, and the renovation of the, uh, the old bait shop there. The, uh, I will say that there, there were, it, the com application was so complete, it included plans uh, that they approved, and I think it was a misunderstanding by the third party uh, installer of the equipment, that being the zip line and the swing, that the 
uh, that they had, they thought they had permission to do that. And it wasn't until uh, the architect got brought in on the boathouse, uh, I'm sorry, the bait house renovation that, and they brought us into the picture to uh, work with the staff because it was, we're changing the use in that building. That's when this process started. And uh, so once we got involved, we uh, advised the client that uh, we needed to do a zoning change because of the change in use in the bait house. They wanted to add the retail use. Uh, and uh, in meetings with the staff, they asked us to go ahead and include all three tracks so that we could uh, have uh, everything that's being proposed out there under one SPUD. So application has, came forward. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very simple SPUD. It has a total of six uses, um, which include the, the ability to have retail in the uh, old uh, remodeled bait house. They're adding facilities to that for restrooms uh, and uh, a, a stopping station for the trail that goes right through there. So it's really uh, a revitalization of a, of a long passed over piece of uh, Oklahoma City Park and, and Public Lake. Um, I'm going to introduce um, Mike here in a minute and he'll share a little bit about his involvement on here and the number of years he's been involved in this. But uh, I've had, a, had the privilege of working with the Boathouse Foundation in several projects around the city and I've, uh, they have done a remarkable amount of work in our city in, in activating uh, our kids and providing services for uh, entertainment and activities. So uh, the SPUD simply allows the buildings that are there to exist. Uh, we're expanding the Boathouse storage building on the north and adding a deck that's permitted, the, none of the buildings will be any higher than the existing buildings there. We did meet with a few of the neighbors that uh, live across uh, Overholster Drive to the east. Uh, we listened to their concerns. We've offered a few uh, changes to be made, and I'm sure they'll share their opinion. Uh, we did include in the language in the PUD that uh, the activities on the existing on-street parking that's on the east side of Overholster Drive will be limited. Uh, there, there won't be any activities permitted there. There won't be any tents permitted there or food truck usage, which has been done in the past, not by these activities, by, by other users of the uh, lake area. And so we tried to restrict that as much as we can. Uh, the uses of the bait house will be, uh, again, uh, selling uh, tickets to the venue, uh, advertising the Boathouse Foundation functions, uh, and then uh, the retail use to be able to sell. Uh, currently, there was a cafe in there, but they want to be able to sell uh, T-shirts and things like that as well. So um, the SPUD was uh, denied by Planning Commission. I think it was uh, a situation that I think that they, there, there was a consideration that there might have been bad motive. And I can uh, attest to you that the, there was no bad motive. There was misunderstanding. Uh, by the third party installer. Uh, activities out there have stopped, uh, as I mentioned, until uh, we complete this process. Um, and so with that, I'd like to ask Mike to come up and talk a little bit about how it's going to be used. Hello, everyone. Mike Knopp, Oklahoma City Boathouse Foundation. Well, um, the origins of everything going on in the Boathouse District are really Lake Overholzer and, and the east side of Lake Overholzer. For 18 years, I've been involved in that project, and it has been a kind of a slow evolution of, of uh, the facilities out there. When we first came in, it was a it was a bait house and an old cafe, and we did take it over, and it was you know severely dilapidated. There was a lot of overgrown uh, trees and shrubs, a, a chain link fence. Uh, a lot of trash, and we spent several years, really as a volunteer-driven effort to kind of bring it back to, to life. Um, and over the years, we've made continual improvements. We've received some grants for landscaping and, and beautification. Um, however, recently, much due to the momentum of what is going on downtown and all the projects and the, all the youth programs that have been so successful, we've been able to um, attract more support and specifically support to kind of fulfill our vision to kind of re um, bring the Route 66 or the Lake Overholzer facilities really back to life in a way that is 
very complementary to the quality of the projects that are downtown and really can serve that side of the community. Um, and so that was really the spirit behind this project is it was to really take this momentum that we've gained downtown and, and thanks to the support of the Ann Lacey Foundation, um, making a very sizable investment in the beautification and enhancement out there. So what is currently being planned is really um, uh, programs and, facil and, and uh, activities that are appropriate for that particular area in that it's much more nature oriented. We have a wildlife refuge. We've, we've always done kayak rentals and youth programs. All of that will continue. Um, we've always, you know, we've, we've had um, uh, community, this, this uh, facility is a community gathering spot that will continue as well and then be, be enhanced. The facility will be opened up to where we can have uh, community, community Boy Scout events, youth uh, events, neighborhood events, and that's really what it's envisioned. This, this boathouse or this building is right on the trail that will soon be linked to the Oklahoma River Trail System thanks to MAPS 3. So we actually see this as kind of a trailhead that um, people will gather here, cyclists, runners, use the facilities, um, and so we're, you know, we're really excited about that. Um, and then we're adding additional features, um, adventure activities that are complementary again to what we do downtown. Our vision again has all been about kind of developing an outdoor culture among the, the community and doing things that inspire people to get active and get moving and and uh, and kind of as we envision the the climbing, the jumping, the zipping, the paddling, all of those things are kind of the the modern equivalent of the old playground back, you know. You're, and so it's very safe, it's very um, controlled, but it's it's part of our vision of getting people outside and active. And so that's really what we're focusing on out there. Um, and we'll be making additional improvements uh, to the Stroud House, which is the old boat house, to make it uh, be, to essentially make it complementary to the uh, renovations of the Route 66 boathouse. So um, again, I, it, I, I feel like we've, we've been out there for a long time and, and have received tremendous uh, feedback through the years about what we're doing out there and then specifically with, uh, with the current programming and the current renovations, there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm about um, the enhancements that are made out there. So. Mike, yes. what do you all have invested in a capital expense at this point, and what do you anticipate going forward? The, uh, the whole project is a little over a million dollars, and the, the, and as far as to date, uh, there's probably about $250,000 okay. so far. Yeah. And how many people work there now, and how many people would work there now when you're done? We have, uh, well, we have programming, so we have coaches that are there every day, and that, that is currently going on. Um, that's that's uh, several coaches, and then we'll have, an, what, what this will allow us to do is we'll have somebody that actually is always there manning the facility, and that'll be at least, uh, d depending on the time, uh, it'd be one person to open the facility, then all the activities will incorporate other uh, staff members, and we, we think it's probably up around 15 people. So. Okay. On a, I, the times I've been out there, there hadn't been a whole lot of cars out right. there. Uh, other than events, how many cars are going to be there on a daily basis? Well, as we see it, um, there, there will certainly, you know, there's going to be more activity due to the, even the trail expansion. The activities are going to be centralized really on the island area across from the boathouse in, in terms of what people will, uh, the new attractions and activities. but. They have a limitation on the number of people that can actually use them. I mean, it's a small, fairly small building, and, and it's not at the scale of what we have downtown. So we really don't see a significant increase in traffic, and it's being counter-programmed. Our programming, like when all our kids show up, that will be at a different time than when the, the facilities are open for people just to rent a kayak or, or go out and, and get on the zip line. So we feel like we've got a plan to balance the traffic and the parking issues out there. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, it's really directed for James. James, I mean, and, uh, what was the reasons that the Planning Commission voted to deny this? Can you speak on that? Uh, I, I don't think they had very good reasons. I think that they thought that, like Tim said, that the, the motives were 
bad that they were basically ignoring the zoning and there was some talk of the Boathouse Foundation being arrogant and that the because of the cities involved with it that it just going through and so I, th I think that was the basis for most of the uh, we're going to hear some from some protests. yeah so I, I we we'll probably hear from the other side there. of the story <clears throat> okay yeah just right that. Okay, one, one question yeah, do we have yeah. any critical deadlines that are soon approaching well the summer <laughs> you know, we're we are uh, we, our intent was to really try to be open for the summertime and one thing that has occurred and I can pass these around these are rem renderings of the uh, the project improvements um, right now it's very primitive there's no facilities there's not even any restrooms now because the facility has been gutted and we have youth programs and camps for the summertime that are already in in planning stages and currently programs going on out there so we would love to be able to open everything up for the summertime and that and knowing that it'll still take time to, to get this completed but we can at least start to use the facilities so all right Mike thanks thank you very much uh -huh. let me call up three people who have uh, signed up to speak Randy Gassaway we might either jointly do this or yeah, she's next up if you okay. want if Fine. yeah if she um, chooses to come up my name is Randy Gassaway. I live at 3133 Lakeview Manor Drive. If you look at the drawing there, my property backs up to East Overholster Drive, and I'm just south and east of the existing parking lot, again, on the east side of where the Boathouse District is highlighted on that drawing there. Um, <clears throat> we kind of find out about this in April, and we came to the Planning Commission, and we had some objections at that point in time about the zoning request because uh, we have several concerns and at the, at the planning commission one of the uh, commissioners stated that probably I'd take a look back and see if this is exactly what we want to do for this area so uh, I think that's what has already been discussed here but this is going to have uh, our concerns are related to uh, noise and traffic and we talked a little bit about that with Mike but he said there's like 15 people there, but we've lived there for the last eight years, and there has been a market increase in traffic, and our concern about traffic is, is safety. That's a very small road. It's got a 20-mile-an-hour speed limit restriction, and I think, as either Tim or Mike said, that's a little bridge that, on 31st Street. So uh, if, if, the, if there was an event there, how are we going to evacuate in the event of a, an emergency or safety concerns? And um, I just don't know that this is the right move for this area. I'm totally supportive of the of the boathouse district and putting the, the facilities in for the runners and the walkers and the kayakers, but when you bring in a potential amusement attraction such as a zip line or this giant swing, uh, that changes the dynamics of the whole area. And Randy, does your property um, open up to the cul-de-sac or do you open up, does your drive go off of Lakeshore Drive? If you don't mind, Lakeview. sir, I, I can hand out some pictures of the area but I, what I'm trying to decide is d does your house open up to the to the street you're referring to or do you open up to the cul-de-sac it opens up to the cul-de-sac okay so and you the, you, the, the back of my house is is it's is, the back of your house okay yes, sir it faces west and I have a great view of the lake and unfortunately I have a great view of the zip line and the giant swing facilities for jump as well mm -hmm. okay you, when you want to pass something out uh, I can <clears throat> There should be one extra. I would like to. On, on this, this is a view from my backyard as you walk out. Again, the last page shows my property in relation to the boathouse, but this is the this is the way it looks from my perspective. And if you go to page two, this is again the bridge that you have to walk over and it slightly to both the north and the south is where the parking, proposed parking is going to be for this. 
I also want to point out that on a daily basis, there's probably as many as four to five boats out here that fish off of this lake. So they use the boat ramp, which is also part of this zoning request. Page three shows uh, as you cross the bridge, looking back to the southeast, this is what, the, what, the, uh, what has been built. This is the, the uh, rock wall and then the zip line facility. And that corrugated building there, I think that's going to be the, on, on page four, that's going to be the sales office for the planned facilities. And then page five shows a picture of the facilities. Again, it's rather crude, and I'm not sure this is exactly what the city wants this to look like. And then uh, page six is a copy of the, is a picture of the, of the base of the uh, giant swing, but you can see where the footings are. There's some maintenance issues already propping up here. And if you look in the back of that picture, that's how, that's the back of my house as it, as it looks across the street. So it's, that, it's very close. That green belt there, and is that your property or is that, is that our property or who's, who's? The, that the green belt, uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you're, well, uh, on the back page, the, the, oh, the yes. The property sir. between your fence and the street. Okay, the fence and the street is the city's right of way. I believe okay. it's mainly for the sewer, but I maintain that property and, and uh, but anyway, it's, it's not mine. My, my fence line runs, runs exactly where the fence is and it cuts across that property back to the, back to the south. Okay. It is, it is your right, it's the city's right of way. Okay. Mainly because of the sewer, but there's no boundary between my property and where, where it butts up east over Holster Drive. All right. Well, we have a couple other people that yes, want to sir. speak, I'm, too. Thanks, thank Randy. You. Thank you very much. Uh-huh. Uh, Tammy, do you want to speak? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I might pull the microphone down. Yeah, I'm short. I worked all night, so bear with me if I get okay. stumbled up here. Uh, I live at 3133 Lakeview Manor Drive, and like my husband said, when he was talking about the fence, that stockade fence that you see there in that picture, that's not the fence. That fence is our fence line. The, the black wrought iron fence that's closer up to the house, that's just a short fence. So we own all the way out to a short right of way to that road. I just wanted to make sure you understood that. Okay. What, my frustration with this is that we bought this house eight years ago, no, almost nine years ago, thinking this is where we were going to live. We had a beautiful view of the lake. The bait house, the boat house was there, but when we moved in, that was not operated. It was vacant and old and dilapidated. But it wasn't as if it was being used and now they're using it for something else. It was used in the past and then it had been vacant. When we moved in, it was vacant, it was not used at all. And then the boat house came in. They did do a lot of renovations. They, made, they did clear out some shrubs, some trees, and that was great. It was still peaceful. Now it's not peaceful. It's starting to, the traffic has 80%. It's increased 80% in the last year. It's still okay until last, like a few months ago, we're out on a walk and all of a sudden we have these huge structures that they built. We had no idea what was going on. What I'm opposed to is the rezoning strictly because of the amusements. We have two other boathouse districts that have the same exact rides, the chair, the swing, and the zip line. The other thing that they told us, they did meet with us to talk about our concerns between the last meeting and this meeting. And during that time, they told us that what was built there was the only thing that was going to be there. Nothing else was going to be built, no more structures. Uh, but if you look at their website, there is another structure that they are advertising, which is a bridge, a suspension bridge of some type. I don't know where that's going to be. Anywhere we've looked, we can't find that now. So I don't know if that's just on the website or if it's actually going to be built. We didn't find out about this uh, proposal for the rezoning until our neighbors told us. Uh, and that's how we came to the last meeting. So we were surprised. You know, it, it just took us by surprise. We felt very, uh, we were offended. We paid a lot of money for that house and that property and we pay a lot of taxes and, you know, we're, we're loyal to Oklahoma City. We, we're all about the community. I'm a, I'm a registered nurse. I volunteer with the Red Cross. I, I'm all about community. But trying to sleep during the daytime because I work at night right now with the noise, 
you get 14, 15 year old kids out there on those zip lines, they're gonna be screaming. There's no way around it. And we can already, last summer, they had staging areas for the different groups, the Boy Scout groups, the field trips. And they do try to keep those away from our property, but you can't. People migrate, we've had to call neighbors to go ask them to leave our property because it's a liability. They've also offered a, what kind of uh, barrier do we want? We don't want a barrier. We bought that property for the view. We bought that property for the activities that, the quiet activities, the kayaking, the biking, the riding. That's what we wanted. That's what we bought our house for. We didn't know any of this was gonna happen. And now, you know, here we've got it. The only other thing is, uh, they're talking about how it's organic. They're, they're not painting the structures because they want it to look natural and organic. There's nothing organic about a giant structure sticking up out of the middle of the water, you know, on the edge of the water. There, there's nothing organic about that. And in my mind, there's many other places in Oklahoma City that have already been developed that we can do these same attractions. Why do we have to take one piece of Oklahoma City that has not been developed and now we have to develop it? You know, we have people that are selling, uh, they're renting paddle boards on the side of the lake now. We had food trucks last year, not because of the boathouse, but because of what the boathouse brings. They offer rides and attractions, community service is gonna come and support that. You know, and that's the, so, I'm just going to summarize real quick after all that emotional stuff. I, uh, I'm worried about safety because we are open to the, I have allergies really bad, I can't quit water. We are open to the, you know, we're open to the road out there. And in the past, we haven't had much traffic. So more visibility, more crime, more litter, more traffic. The roads are small. And one of those pictures, the, what they told us is the bait house, that if they're revamping, that's where they want to have everyone park. Then they walk over to get their tickets, then they do their rides, and then they walk back to their car. That's up and down that bridge. That bridge, there's a sidewall that's about three foot tall with holes in between. Kids walk on there all the time. If you're getting cars and people walking back across that, you've got, you've got safety issues, we've got traffic issues. We've got litter issues, we've got liability issues because of our property, um, and we've got crime issues that I'm worried about. There's a police station there that's never manned. It's rarely is there a policeman there. There's no lights out there, and we didn't want lights. That's why we moved to this area. So there's a lot of things that I feel like have not been addressed with research and development. I mean, they put on their website that this was all going to be started in June before it was even rezoned. And then the last thing that I want is, we already have one neighbor that put their house up for sale about two weeks ago. We have another neighbor that told me last week that they're considering it. They've lived there like 15 years, I believe. And so our property values, you know, we're, we're very concerned about our property values. You know, we're in our 50s, we don't have time to make that money up. You know, I don't wanna have to do that. Uh, that's a big thing. And um, there was one more thing I was gonna say, but. The property values are big, I think that's it. This, I just feel like maybe you do a little bit of research and see if you wanna take a small piece of land that hasn't been developed, and now we wanna commercialize it. You know, they're gonna sell season passes. That's like white water. You're gonna sell season passes out there, and it's only during the summer, well, the summer is when we can only enjoy our, our view, you know, our yard, where we can sit out back and have people over and enjoy that, and it's just very disappointing. Okay. Thanks, Tammy. Mm -hmm. um, Rob Horitz. Good morning. Uh, my name is Rob Horitz, and I live at 3136 Lakeview Manor Drive. Uh, my property is located uh, directly across the street uh, from the boathouse, and it actually adjoins with the uh, parking lot. Um, I believe there's a time and a place for everything, and uh, I believe change is good, but sometimes change isn't good. And uh, about three years ago, we moved here. I moved from Colorado very reluctantly, but the military tells me what to do and I do it. Um, I work at Tinker and we scoured the entire area looking for a place that would offer some sort of outdoor activities that were close by. Well, sure enough, that house that we bought was for sale and uh, in dire need of renovation, so we put a ton of money into it. Um, but I really come to love 
that area because what it offers and what it represents. Um, the, the bike trail, the jogging trail, all of that is awesome. It borders a wildlife refuge area to the north and a lot of those birds flock to the south and along that river you'll see them um, and there's folks out there fishing, it's very quiet. Um, now if you picture yourself downtown at the, uh, the boathouse area there with all the zip lines and you just close your eyes, you'll have no doubt on a Saturday that you're not at my lake. At my lake it's very quiet, it's very peaceful, it's, it's, very, it's very awesome. Um, and unfortunately I think where we're at right now is we may have put the cart before the horse as far as building these structures. Um, the zoning was R1 residential and with that R1 residential I was under the impression that they were allowed to do recreational activities and in my definition of recreation, running, biking, kayaking, that all fits that bill. Um, but my problem is, is that we're starting to put in amusement park rides, um, entertainment value rides, which sure, it does draw a crowd, but you're drawing a crowd that's loud, noisy, and maybe not really even working out. I mean, I, I get it that, you know, crossing maybe that uh, bridge may be a little bit physical, but latching up to a zip line or being flung forward into the air is not exactly physical activity. So um, money better spent would have probably have been put a trail around the entire lake um, that would uh, allow people a safe route around that lake because I do bike around that lake and I do run around that lake and I can't tell you how many times I swear I almost died. And there have been fatalities on that lake. Um, and that's, that's, that's funded by MAPS 3. Okay, so hopefully that's coming, and maybe I should have been prioritized first, but um, my point is also is that I am in the military, and we don't have the option, and I do have the option of buying a house versus renting. I do have that option, um, but I learned very quickly that when I buy a house, I got to be very careful because in three years, if something happens, I can be underwater so far, and I've got friends, what you guys heard about the housing bubble, um, throughout other areas of the country and when they sold their houses they are now in a financial state where they've lost money and uh, it, you know it affects their credit for several years nothing to, to their part um, and I really feel that this moving forward with this amusement park and I'll call it an amusement park because that's what I think it is um, will devalue my property um, it's taking away from what it actually has represented for many years um, as, a, as a beautiful precious lake um, that people enjoy on the weekends to get out and away from the city, away from the noise. Um, we're bringing that right here. When I think about Lake Hefner, um, most of that lake's pretty nice. Uh, then you get to where the commercial part is, and if you've been along that trail, there's always that distinct smell of the dumpster. And since I live right behind that house, I do not want to have that dumpster smell, because I know they're talking about doing a cafe. And currently, they do serve um, like bottled water and maybe sell chips, but there's no cooking, there's no anything like that. So um, what they do right now, I don't understand why we can't just vamp that up, vamp up the current programs, make them more appealing to the public versus trying to utilize um, gimmicky type toys, which may be used initially, but I think will be overlooked and then we'll be, we'll be stuck with these structures just standing there for years, and I don't think they're gonna get much use. Um, now as far as the, uh, the parking and the trash, um, the parking, like I said, there, there's, a, there's a parking lot there, I'm sure it'll be a lot fuller, uh, but the, the boat guys contend that the parking will be on the other side, which that won't happen unless the, our parking is full first, I get that. Um, and the other thing, like Tammy had mentioned, is that along that bridge, there is a small barrier that anybody that was maybe even drunk could fall off of that, um, let alone a kid or something. Uh, so I think you do have some serious safety concerns there. I don't understand why the, uh, the zoning is a requirement to be changed, because it has already operated thus far so long um, under its current. Um, one of the things I heard was that there was gonna be a, a restroom, um, and a restroom outside that, and I don't know how that's gonna be, uh, managed as far as is it going to be open 24-7 um, because I really don't want to have an area where I've got uh, folks that don't have a bathroom congregating and using that area and especially hanging out there at night and that whole nine yards. 
Um, and the last thing I think I had is that, uh, or two things, um, does the boat house have the authority to rezone as they are a leaser? Or a, they don't actually own the property, so do they even have the authority to rezone that property? That was one of the questions I had. And the last thing is, is if this does go forward, um, I, being honest, um, I love my neighbors, but if push comes to shove, and this thing does flourish where my house is, I would consider rezoning my house and allowing somebody else to come in and commercialize that as well. And if I did that, that may kind of ruin that whole area and that residential type stuff. So I would be fearful of that on any rezoning that it will continue throughout the neighborhood. And I'll tell you that I would do that versus losing money on my house. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Rob. You're going to have to come to the microphone if you want to speak again. What I forgot to say was that we've talked and we do want our, we would, if this goes through, I think both of us want to, we would pursue rezoning our property as well. All right. Just to make up for the difference. Thanks, Tammy. All right, James. <clears throat> well, all right. Um, and I think to address that, uh, this rezoning is, uh, the Oklahoma City, it's through Oklahoma City, but it's in, it was initiated by the Boathouse Foundation. Is, is that true? Is, is that kind of how is it Water how Trust works? land? Or Water Trust, or? Yeah, it's Water, it's water Trust land. Because it, well, it, who initiated it, the rezoning? Yeah, who who'd actually initiated it? We, we've heard enough, thanks. It's about the rezoning. The, uh, Tim Johnson filed the application. It was initiated by the city of Oklahoma City, is my understanding. So, okay. And we can, the city can initiate rezoning applications. Okay. Um, well, my thoughts on it are, uh, t to me, all of the, the uses that this uh, SPUD um, adds are completely compatible to a lake. Um, I think that they complement uh, all of the things that are going on it, around here. Uh, full disclosure that I actually lived on Lakeview Manor Drive. My address was 3116 Lakeview Manor Drive. I didn't back up to the, to the street, but um, all through high school. So I'm real familiar with the, uh, with the street and the area. Um, I think the whole idea of us wanting, uh, would rather live next to an area that uh, has a dilapidated, uh, abandoned bait house um, rather than what's there now, uh, I, I think is a really faulty argument. I, I, don't, I don't think that most people would actually think that. Uh, addressing the property values, um, you know, I can see how uh, somebody that thinks that, the, that, that, that those two homes are that, uh, the, they get their value from the view. You, you might lose a little bit, but I, I mean, I remember what that used to look like 15 years ago, and it uh, it didn't look like this. And this is better than what it was 15 years ago. Um, so, uh, you know, with that, I mean, it, it the, the planning commission did m mention having a master plan for overholster. Um, I think if there was a master plan, which I'm fine with them producing one if they want to produce one, I think that something like this should be within that master plan uh, for this area. Um, I think whenever you look at, like, look at uh, these the city properties um, that are intended to have recreation uses, at least in my opinion, they are intended to have recreation uses, and a, a private nonprofit um, company wants to come in and upgrade and uh, invest a, a, approximately a million dollars into the property. I mean, I think that uh, we would be pretty dumb to uh, say no to that. And so uh, I've, I've told a few people this, that um, if I would move to deny this, 
or vote against it, it would be the dumbest thing I would have done in the two years that I've been on this council. Um, and I still believe that. I completely understand the um, uh, issues that the neighbors have because Lake Overholzer is a um, much more low key area than Lake Hefner. It's much more low key than the uh, downtown uh, river district. But I think that the, I think the Oklahoma City Boathouse Foundation understands that and uh, wants, to, uh, wants to honor that and wants to be a complement to the area, not, a, not, a, not an amusement park. And so uh, with that, I just open it up to any questions or comments. And, uh, Neil, I, I had a chance to uh, go out there and take a look at it uh, with Mike a couple of Sundays ago. And um, I have to agree with James. I mean, I, I would never call these structures amusement park structures. They're very simple, simplistic structures that do very little to impede a view. Um, I think the enhancements that are happening at that bait shop are terrific and much more in keeping with the neighborhood than they are, you know, a pattern after what's happening down on the river. Um, it's a beautiful area. I was anxious to get my own kayak out there. Um, it is quiet, and but there is parking, you know, behind these buildings. There's good parking already established. Um, I think it it meets the criteria of um, any kind of a master plan that would be designed. And I, I really do think, in talking to some of the folks on the planning commission, that it wasn't this project that they were unhappy about. I think they were just surprised. I think everybody was surprised that the zoning was R1. I think that caught um, caught everybody unaware, and so you know we kind of had to scramble. And the planning commission never likes um, surprises, <laughs> and so I just think they were caught a little bit off guard. And the discussion of a master plan, you know, may be a valid one, but I would agree with James that this would be a very likely component of any master plan that we were to design out there. Okay. Anybody else want to speak before we move uh, on? I have some questions, please. Uh, is there a road to the west of this east overholster drive, or is this the furthest west road? I can't tell if this is a road along the shores. Is yeah, there is an access road on, 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 the, on the peninsula oh. that goes up north and south on the on the shore? Yes, this is a road. It's 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 yeah. East overholster drive is the furthest. It, it uh, on the other it, you got the canal and then that the, an island. But there is an access road that kind of goes up and down the. The shoreline? Yeah, the shoreline. Is that, I don't know how well it's used, but it's, you can see it on the aerials. I don't, it's more of a maintenance road. Yeah, I, I don't for think the, or fisher yeah, access. I don't fisher think. access, I think, right. as much right. as anything. Okay. Right. Yes. Um, Gates. Well, yeah. Could you help me understand? People run out there. Okay, this area right here, I'm going to say on the east side of the proposed three areas, what's located there? Is this, is the bait shop closer to the no, the bait shop's to the east. Okay, it's back over here. That's the closer historic to bait shop, and, it, it, and then to the north of that is a small police uh, facility there. Ranger office, used to be ranger office. This aer aerial may show it a little bit better. The, the service drive, as you've called it, is that. It's, it's kind of a, it's quasi-paved, uh, maybe gravelly, uh, old asphalt. Here's the bait house that fronts onto Overosa Drive. And this is the bridge they were referring to. It's a vehicular bridge that was, was re replaced not that many years ago because the old one washed out in a storm. And where's the zip line, Tim, on, on that? It's on here, crosses from here, across the canal, over to here. Okay. So all the activities are on this tract. A and there's parking over further here. west? Over and, here, uh -huh. in front of the bait house. And there's a strip of on-street parking on the east side of Overhurst Drive. Hmm. You, this depicts the right of way in there. This is right at the back of the paved drive or paved parking. It kind of shows up on the map there. As a resident, that would be a problem for me to have parking right in my backyard. Uh, That's yeah, it, it's, it's, oh. been, it's been there for as long okay. as I know. Well, let me ask a question then. Since we're proposing a spud here, would we be able to control the hours of operations? I mean, is that a part of the spud? We can. It, there's not any language in there now to, that restricts it, but I'm sure the Boathouse Foundation has set hours that they 
uh, can agree to. I wouldn't want activities going on until midnight. Right. We're certainly willing to, uh, you know, to consider that. We just uh, we don't have in the intention of operating after dark in these facilities, and um, unlike the downtown facilities, I mean, we, we believe the latest. Um, we I don't think we've set the hours yet, but it will not it will not go into the late hours. Okay, so during the summer, that would say be nine o'clock. At the latest, eight o'clock. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Pete, Pete. Uh, David's comment brings up a question that I have about it is um, this is a substantial impact on these people that live there. There isn't any question in my mind about that. that the impact is substantial. And not to have a meaningful meeting with them I think is a mistake. If you had one meeting and you didn't come out with anything, I haven't, I, I've looked at this and I haven't seen any changes that were made as a result of the neighborhood meeting. Now, if they say that you could have five meetings and they'd never give an inch on anything, then you probably, that's a waste of time to have another meeting. But David's comment brings up something that should have been negotiated, in my opinion. This is, this is not just a, I mean, it is a mistake. I don't have, I don't think there's any, any, um, um, any attempt to avert or avoid the, com the, the conflict, but I do think somebody should have recognized there's going to be one. I mean, that to me is obvious. If you're going to build that across the street from any of us, you'd know, you'd, you'd know that was a possibility of a conflict. It seems to me if the neighbors are willing to negotiate at all, you ought to have another meeting and try to bring something forward that has less warts on it than this does. Now, it's not my, not my board, but, and, and I, haven't, I haven't heard anybody say they'd give anything on either side. So, but, but the fact is, if, if, as David points out, if hours of operation would m mitigate some of the impact on the neighborhood, that ought, to be, that ought to be discussed. Just saying, well, we'll do that is not quite the same as putting it in the, in the document itself. And I'd, I would like to see you guys have another sit down with the neighbors and see if there aren't things that can be done to mitigate it. It's probably not going to go away. I don't want to, I don't want to, either one of you people that have spoke, I don't, I don't want you to think that I think it'll go away because I don't think it will. But I do think it could be more friendly to a, I don't know how long that neighborhood has been established there, but it's been a long, long, long time. I mean, it's, those houses have been there for many, many years. Um, I'm not sure that entitles you to a forever perfect view of the lake under the under land use laws, but I but I understand feeling that way. Um, but I'm I leave that up to uh, uh, James. But I I just think it seems to me there's still ground here to negotiate to come up with a product that uh, is more up, appealing to everybody. Thank you for bringing that up, Councilman White. Uh, if I didn't make that clear earlier, we did meet with the neighbors. There was about a half a dozen there. We probably spent an hour uh, talking through things. We did offer uh, to put up uh, post and cable as a barrier. They didn't want anything screening. Uh, we were concerned as they were about, uh, you know, the staging of the buses and kids walking on their property and things like that. And we, we've agreed to mitigate that by not allowing bus traffic to park in that little parking area, but to force them over to the other side. And we did add that, that language into the PUD, but none of the post and barrier uh, that we offered to both the uh, property, uh, property there at 30th and then the neighbor up further to the north, and I apologize, I can't think of his name. He's got a big grass area that people pull off that parking on street parking now and go into his grass. We offered to put a barrier there and he didn't want that. They don't want anything to weed eat around. Uh, so we did offer several things that, quite frankly, the hours of operation didn't come up. And uh, I think that's an easy fix that we, we will agree to. Well, my thought is that now they see that the steamroller is ready to roll, they might be a lot more amenable to concessions at this point. So, but again, that's your business. I would just, right. one final comment, if I may. Uh, I understand about the citizens' concerns about keeping an open view of their property, but certainly you may want to consider having wrought iron fences provided, which 
still provides you with a, a good view, but also limits uh, access to your property. I, I'm not getting in the middle of this negotiation, but it is something that I think should at least be considered. All right, James, you'll make a motion. Yeah, I mean, do would do you, do you be willing to write in the hours of operation, like to limit it to 8 p.m.? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, uh, I will move for approval with the amendment of adding that in there. All right. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 9C is an item that's been to the council a couple of times before. This was, uh, you may remember, Doug Cupper coming in and uh, uh, talking to us. Uh, we had a public hearing last meeting. Is there a motion on item 9C? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9D is a public hearing regarding dilapidated structures. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 9D? Cast your votes. 9D passes unanimously. Item 9E is a public hearing regarding unsecured structures. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 9E? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And 9F is a public hearing regarding abandoned buildings. Is anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 9F? All right, how about a motion? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. 9G uh, comes to us from the, the Zoo Trust, and this is in compliance uh, with the state law. Is there a, a motion here? Second. All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9H, I understand we do not need executive session on the salary continuation? That's correct. Okay, how about a motion? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9I, I understand we do not need executive session? Correct. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Nothing necessary on 9J today, so a motion to strike would be in order. Cast your votes. That item is struck from the agenda. Item 9K is claims recommended for denial. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any of the claims listed for uh, recommendation of denial? All right, how about a motion? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 10 is claims recommended for approval. Is there a motion here? Cast your votes. Those claims are approved. Item 11 is items from council. James, you have anything else? All right, Ed. We went down to Dallas last week for this Congress for New Urbanism meeting, and I've gone to a few over the years, but other than I think Russell Klaus went one year to Salt Lake City, there's nobody really from Oklahoma to talk to. There was an enormous contingent from Oklahoma City, far larger than any other city, like more than 30 people from the Alliance for Economic Development, downtown OKC, uh, young developers, architects, um, Nobody from the planning department, but they had just returned, I think, a couple weeks before from a, uh, a meeting. Um, it was just very exciting, very exciting for the city of Oklahoma City. I think it's just so important to connect to the outside world and, and hear best practices in other cities. And, and I just left there with such uh, hope for Oklahoma City. The Mayor's Development Roundtable does a great job bringing in people for something similar, but there's only so many people you can bring at one time to hear just days and days of, of best practices in other cities, uh, I thought was, was incredibly uh, positive. And, and the enthusiasm if the, as they get involved, I think, will help us as a city. I do think, um, I, I do think that there are some best practices. You know, I, I agree with activating the street, street front on one walker. I don't necessarily agree that we're engaged in necessarily best practices um, in terms of activating, or that we're asking others to do and that's kind of what made the uh, 499 Sheridan expansion so tragic, I think. Um, corporate plazas angulate with buildings angulated uh, from the street uh, don't activate the street front. Sky bridges don't. Clustering parking garages don't. Those kind of things are talked about in textbook after textbook and in all these meetings. And I, I just think that, you know. If we had all worked together, we probably could have had a much better outcome. But those are the kind of things that I think engaging in those meetings and engaging uh, other cities uh, could help us. The other thing I was kind of struck with was they had already um, 
there was a decision last week at the legislature to restrict cities from being able to regulate oil and gas drilling within the city. So as I was sitting there at the meeting, they have they've already moved in terms of climate change to pass mitigation, like ways we can limit climate change to adaptation, just a, almost a sense of inevitability. I mean, I was, I was struck by, like the city of Miami, how much trouble they are in if even the most conservative projections of sea level rising uh, occur, and yet there's just like a sense of denial. They continue to build, there's no, it's, it's just, it's almost like to me like the alcoholic who everyone around them can see that their behavior is high risk and that they should change their behavior but that are unable to, and they have enablers that continue to enable the behavior. Likewise, then that brought me back to Oklahoma City where we're hearing articles from around the country, New York Times, Bloomberg, everybody talking about our disposal wells within water disposal wells within Oklahoma City, around Oklahoma City, the parabolic increase in earthquakes that occurs at the exact same time as our uh, increased use of water disposal wells with uh, horizontal drilling and fracking. And it just almost seems like, it just felt very similar to what they were talking about in Miami, that we are in a sense of denial, that our local media doesn't talk about it, and we're reliant on this external media and everybody at these national meetings talking about what's going on in Oklahoma City and Oklahoma, but for some reason we can't see it here. The legislature's action last week to restrict oil and gas regulation by cities or allowing us to look at these issues feels very much like the enabler, uh, enabling an industry who may be engaged in practices that, that threatens us all. It just seems like we're all one very large quake away from threatening our whole economic framework. Uh, and having the local media look at that uh, and having us, the cities be able to regulate that would seem to be important. But I don't want to take away from how positive it was to have so many people from Oklahoma City uh, discussing these best practices and engaging uh, with the country last week. I thought it was very positive. Thanks. Yeah. Larry? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, it was a pleasure this week, uh, weekend uh, to be able to attend the uh, police awards banquet. And uh, the spirit of uh, that, that meeting was extremely moving to my wife and I as we honored policemen who had uh, risked their lives to protect our citizens in very harrowing situations. In light of what's going on in our nation, it's nice to be a, a resident of Oklahoma City where the, uh, the city police uh, do such an excellent job of, of policing us and providing for our safety. And then yesterday we had the pleasure, some of us, to uh, uh, go and uh, see firsthand the new Lincoln Golf Course uh, structure over in John's area at the first tee, which does a tremendous uh, good for promoting character in our youth. And uh, it was just a, a great experience to walk around that golf course and see an oasis, uh, a very well manicured, well managed facility and a great asset to Oklahoma City. And we're blessed also to have uh, some of the finest public golf in any city in the United States. Thank you, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. Pete? Um, today's uh, Cinco de Mayo. And uh, it's going to be a festival at, on 25th Street this evening, uh, 5 to 9, uh, by the uh, old Oklahoma Opry. The, David and I remember it was the Knob and uh, Mark also would remember that it was the old Knob Hill Theater. Um, but it's, it ought to be a nice event, and I'd invite everybody to come. Be a good op it's a good opportunity to kind of see what the potential for 25th Street really is. It's got huge potential. Um, next, I want to comment a little bit on this continuing controversy that goes on at the legislature with regard to permitting the cities to um, uh, start charter schools. I, 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 I shouldn't talk, I mean, I've said everything that probably needs to be said, but it just sticks in my craw that it is such an affront to the school system. Um, it makes about as much sense to me, you know, I read the article that where, where Senator Holt said that uh, he thought competition would be good. Well, if that's a good idea, why don't we ask the uh, school district to start a fire department? Because maybe our fire department would, could use a little competition. It makes about, that's about how much sense it makes. With all the work that's been put in the last several years to raise the uh, level of, of understanding between the city and the Oklahoma City Public Schools and all the public schools, not just Oklahoma City, MAPS 3, I mean MAPS for Kids provided funding for all schools in the metro area. 
And that, that I just think to, to spit in the face of those school administrators um, is, is beyond me. I, 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 I will try not to talk about it next week. David? Uh, last, wait, I have one more thing. Okay. I, have, I, have a, I have a mea culpa. That, uh, several weeks ago, there was a discussion about uh, sidewalks. And I uh, took the position that uh, the sidewalks had come from the general fund. And after research, I must admit that I was wrong. It came from the excess money. It was, it's kind of like this fund balance. And, and I think that may have what is that you can't make an excuse while you're making a mea culpa, can you? <laughs> kind of takes away from it, right? But I do think where I lost, where I lost track of it was it, it didn't come from the contingency inside the MAPS 3. It came from the excess money that's been collected. And that's a, that's a hair splitting uh, difference for everybody listening, but yeah, I think that's what happened. And I apologize. I, you, you two were right. Okay. David? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, last week, I got to meet with the uh, residents of uh, Meadowcliff uh, Housing uh, Facility. It's a HUD finance uh, senior housing facility. And for those who have a, uh, a, a bad perception of HUD assisted housing, I'd like to invite you out there. Uh, it's a great little facility, certainly needs some improvements. and. And I want to begin lobbying now because they're going to make a request for, uh, I think, $500,000 from the CDBG fund. And uh, it's just a little area off of May Avenue and I-240. Uh, there's close to 60 separate units there. Uh, and these are senior citizens who, you know, we all can't. Uh, unfortunately become wealthy and, and live in very nice places. This is just a very modest area, but very well maintained. And, and I want to thank them for inviting me out uh, to listen to their story. And uh, it's currently being managed by the Volunteers of America, a great organization who really goes uh, all out to provide safe, secure housing uh, in many areas. Secondly, um, I serve as the council's representative for the MAPS Oversight Committee. And I think it's appropriate, or one of my responsibilities is to provide a, uh, a line of communication between the activities in the various MAPS committees and the council. And so I'm gonna bring a little bit of information back uh, that from an area that's getting a lot of attention right now. That's the new convention center. Uh, They've narrowed it down to four proposed uh, locations, and all four of them are fairly close to the new Central Park area. Um, and so I think any of the four would be uh, a good choice. Just a couple of comments. One, uh, and Ed, I'm going to have to get some assistance from you. When they show the positives and negatives of each uh, area, on the two areas that are more west, they're about a couple of blocks further west than what some of the original sites were, and they were calling that a negative. You know, for us not to be able to walk a couple of blocks between uh, a convention center and restaurants or other activities, I just find that hard to say that that's a negative. So we, we've got to turn that perception around that walking a couple of blocks isn't that big of a deal. In fact, it'd be healthy for us. In fact, when I have to go to seminars, you know, it's really a very poor situation because you're stuck in meeting rooms for eight hours. You eat a lot of carbs and unhealthy food. Uh, we need to encourage people to walk. And that kind of leads me to another issue. Some of the concerns, too, address the possibility of, of uh, possible, well, they haven't said that, but some of the uh, possible things that may develop are closures of North and South streets. And Jim, this is kind of directed towards you as well as the MAP staff. Since we're getting so close to I-40 in that area, to close a North-South street doesn't seem to present a problem from my perspective because they're going to dead end right there at I-40 within a couple of blocks anyway. So, uh, and one of the 
possibilities is that the new convention center is uh, maybe shares, maybe that's a good term, some of the land that's in the uh, Central Park. But if nothing else, if we were to close a particular street, and I was thinking about this too, not with the convention hotel, but with just a hotel or an office building that was to be constructed by the Central Park, to eliminate the street in between the two and have the park become like its front yard, I think it would be attractive to a developer to say, we're putting in this new development, whether it's an office building or uh, a hotel or even a convention center that is adjacent and it's not separated by a street to the Central Park. It, it would enhance both of those, I think. Uh, so anyway, I'd welcome your comments and thoughts as we proceed with that. And I think the committee is planning to have a recommendation by the 1st of July. So mm -hmm. It'll anyway. Be here before you know it. Yeah. Meg? Just, just a quick, um, yesterday I discovered that we had some little ducks trapped uh, in a storm sewer downtown at the corner of California and Walker. And I just want to thank some of our staff. They went out and lifted up the manhole cover. A citizen jumped in, and we saved four little ducks downtown. It was a really, it was a really cute thing. It was blowing up on Twitter like crazy. So, <laughs> compliments to the city staff for helping us rescue our wildlife downtown. Great. All right, John. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and I want to echo uh, Larry's comment as it relates to Lincoln uh, Clubhouse. Uh, that particular clubhouse, I would have to say, is a state-of-the-art uh, clubhouse where people can actually go in and have a uh, conference, and after their conference is adjourned, go out and play golf. Um, and so I think uh, having a, a public facility like that is, is awesome, and also the simple fact that it's in seven heaven ward seven is, is a good thing. Um, to, to comment about uh, charter schools, um, and I don't feel like giving a sermon uh, this morning, but I will have to disagree with you uh, respectfully, uh, Councilman White, as it relates to uh, charter schools uh, in Oklahoma City Public Schools. Um, I do believe in extreme cases that the city should have the ability to uh, charter charter schools. And I can give you several examples of why. Um, but because of time, I won't get off into all the details, but uh, I, I'm gonna talk about the number one performing school that I have, for example, in Northeast Oklahoma City. I wish I can say that this particular school is a Oklahoma City public school, um, but it's not. It's a charter school. This particular charter school would like to expand they, if you look at the, the rating system from, from A to F, they are an A school. Matter of fact, they are listed in the top 43, uh, top 43 schools uh, in America. And I wish I can say that it's a Oklahoma City Public Schools. Now, I, I, I support the school district. I wanna be very clear, I support the school district but the, the type of quality education that they are delivering in Northeast Oklahoma City, I'm sorry, it's just plain up pitiful. And I'm just gonna use the word pitiful because it is. I cannot get big home developers to build in Northeast Oklahoma City. One of the number one reasons why uh, is, is the, the quality of education. Uh, and, and so I do believe as a city, as we continue to grow, that we have to look at other options. Again, I'm a strong supporter of the school district. Uh, every, every time the school district has a vitamin, I've been there, you know, and, and I don't have to have an invitation to help the school district. I help the school district every single day. Um, but for example, in Northeast Oklahoma City, we need to do something different. Uh, and, and, and I am, uh, saddened at the simple fact that the school district will not help KIPP expand. KIPP would like to expand. Their model works. I mean, they are at a school. And, and again, I, I, I don't want to debate this. I don't want to give, give a sermon. I, I believe there is a time and a place, but I do disagree uh, um, uh, with your comments respectfully. Um, but we do need to have uh, some options. For example, Northeast Oklahoma City. Then I look at another uh, charter school, Lighthouse. 
Uh, they wanted to, to do a charter school in Northeast Oklahoma City. And the school district said no. Matter of fact, the school district originally said, okay, yes, yes, okay, yes, yes. And then the school district all of a sudden changed its mind and said, hey, well, we don't want y'all to serve kids in Northeast Oklahoma City. Go on the south side. I think that was a slap in Northeast Oklahoma City's face. I do understand that the south side, which I do represent as well, has a huge uh, issue for us uh, schools being uh, crowded. My heart breaks every time I go into the schools on the south side to see kids in stairways trying to learn. It breaks my heart. Um, but, but the simple fact that the school district uh, is turning their back in, on Northeast Oklahoma, yeah, I, 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 I would have to say, hey, we need to at least explore what it would mean. We at least need to explore. Uh, and, and then I look at how the, the school district uh, treats some of the schools uh, that I have in, for example, in Northeast Oklahoma City, where I have a, a science school, a science and mathematics school in Northeast Oklahoma City where the school district refuses uh, to fix the labs. They only have, a, in this particular school, Northeast Academy, only has one working lab, and this is a science school. So, so my, my view is just a little bit different. Then I look at my, 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 my black elected officials who serve Northeast Oklahoma City. Their view is different. Uh, Senator Anastasia Pittman signed on to uh, uh, what David Holt's doing. It's also State Representative George Young. So my view is just a, a, a little bit different. Now again, I, I support the school district 110%, 110%. But I do think, as a city, we just need to explore the option in extreme cases. In extreme cases. And I, I'm sorry, I don't like the decisions the school district is making in reference to things that's happening in Northeast Oklahoma City. I only have a 1A school. Only 1A school. And that's a charter school. Originally, yeah, I'm, I'm, I was all for public education, I'm still for public education, but at the same time, we have to start offering choices. Okay. Can, can Thanks, John. Mark? Can I, just say, can, I, can I say one thing? John, I, I think that's, I'm glad you brought that up, and I think it's very healthy, and I don't think there's anything more important that we could discuss. Uh, Councilman White brought this up a couple times before and asked if there were any differing opinions, and, and nobody really spoke up. So I'm, I just want to thank you for, for giving a contrarian opinion, and and, uh, and I think that discourse around the horseshoe is extremely healthy on this issue. I, I would ask, if, if this were to pass through the legislature, I mean, what, how, what, would, what would we do as a city? What would you see as a potential plan? How could we use that? How would you want us to use that uh, to help the Northeast side? And, and I think if it was to pass, I think as, us as a council and, and also the different communities, whether the South Side or Northeast Oklahoma City, and, and also with uh, the school dis district and other uh, people, have a clear dialogue of of how to proceed. You know, I, I'm open. I don't think that people should run straight to uh, the city council. I think they should follow. Uh, a, a certain uh, process, but in extreme cases, like I mentioned, we should have that, you know, uh, ability when, when a certain community is ignored, and, and like, for example, Northeast Oklahoma City was ignored, and, I, and, and, that's, and that's just how I feel, um, because anytime you tell something that's working, no, something's not right there, you know, so I'm, I'm open, uh, to 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 the dialogue, you know, and I, I think it's good, and like you, and I and I enjoy your comments. Thank you, and I think we should have some some uh, discussions as it relates to it. But I don't think the the city council should be a, a entity should run straight to the city council. But I think uh, I think in extreme cases, yes, we do. So could we? I mean, some of the success of KIPP seems to be the people running it, maybe. But how? You, you mentioned that they want to expand and they're being denied. Would the city council be able to help them expand? I, I we, if, you know what, I'm open, you know, I, I'm open to different ideas. And if, if we look at what happened to uh, John Rex, I mean, the, the people built a brand new charter school for downtown Oklahoma City, example. 
um, without any results. And, and I say without any results, meaning that the city, whomever, committed to build a new school without having concrete numbers like a kill. And I, I'm, I'm just using that as an example. Um, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm open, but, but I, I'm, I'm open. I'm open to the dialogue. One of the things you need to be open to is the successful charter schools cherry pick the kids. The school district has a responsibility far beyond that. They have to educate every kid in the city. Every kid. They, don't, they can't say, uh, if your parents don't come to, to the meeting tonight, you can't be in our school. The schools that, that, um, that are successful are able to do that. And that's not, if that's what you want, if you want education for only those people that have parents that are involved, you know, we, this is a battle we fought for 50 years. It's kind of like, uh, it, I, we're, I, I would think we're past it. I mean, everybody wants to blame the parental involvement now for why we don't have, well, I mean, they're not gonna come. I mean, we've gotta find another solution. But I don't believe the solution is cherry picking the kids that parents are involved, which hurts the public schools and I just, I, I just I, you know, we do have a difference of opinion. Right. I, I just, I'm, I'm I not just saying cherry, cherry, cherry pick. I'm saying we need to come up with some options. Well, one, one option, in my opinion, is not to let them cherry pick. That's my option. If they take every kid, I think I think I-89 would let you, would form schools everywhere, if if you if you take uh, attendance boundaries and you treat every kid in the school. But that's not the way they work. And, and let's, I think let's, we, let's might, we might as well get that day. out on the table. That's the way that, that's. I, I agree the discussion's been invigorating, but there's, there's other days we'll have opportunities to discuss the education. Yeah, Mark. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I look forward to uh, attending the Summerfield uh, Annual Homeowners Association meeting tonight where there'll be a presentation on the new Northwest Wellness Center. Um, for those folks that would like to attend, it's at Spring Creek Baptist Church on North MacArthur, just south of 122nd. Thank you. All right, thanks, Mark. City Manager reports. With three presentations this morning, the first up is Mike Carrier with the CVB. Good morning. Pleasure to see you all again. Mike Carrier from Oklahoma City Convention and Visitors Bureau. Mr. Stonecipher, welcome. Good to see you, sir. Um, you all have our report uh, was included in the packet. Just uh, a few highlights in there. We're we're three quarters of the way through the the uh, the year. Our bookings are solid. Um, we continue to see interest in Oklahoma City. Uh, we are seeing uh, interest in out years based on what is uh, being uh, talked about in terms of our new convention center. Uh, and as soon as we have things that we can speak more specifically about with planners, we will certainly begin uh, a stronger effort toward that. But in the meantime, the Cox Center continues to be our uh, our destination. Uh, the the major problem we run into, and we continue to run into this, have for several years, is the lack of other meeting space. Uh, here in Oklahoma City, once you get outside of the Cox Convention Center, we don't have much meeting space. And so it presents challenges to us, but we continue working with the existing hotels and facilities that offer space in a variety of places around the city to try to fill that. Uh, so far, we have generated 324 leads for future business. That represents almost 400,000 uh, potential hotel room nights. Uh, that's a strong level of interest in Oklahoma City. And some of those uh, leads go as far out as, uh, as 2023. Uh, so there are people that are looking at us well in advance. Um, we have had 38 site visits this year. We've uh, provided assistance to a, a little over 180 groups through our convention services department uh, that assist people when they do come in for their conventions and meetings uh, along with other activities. So uh, it's been a, a, a fairly busy year. It was a, uh, a good spring of slightly down from last year, uh, but don't forget that last year we had the Division I wrestling tournament which brought in thousands of people that stayed the entire time. Uh, I don't know if you all have seen the, the latest uh, bed tax report, uh, but for the month of March, which was when that was here, we were down less than 1%. Uh, 
which is an outstanding result because we had been up double digits for several years in advance uh, of last year with the, uh, with the, uh, the March uh, results. And so only having a 1% drop uh, is, is excellent when you consider we didn't have the blockbuster event this year. In the equine market, uh, our horse shows continue to be very strong. Uh, I have had the opportunity to meet the, uh, the uh, new uh, executive vice president of the Quarter Horse Association, uh, very nice uh, gentleman, uh, very anxious to get his feet wet in the equine industry. He comes from the cattle industry. Uh, his comment was that uh, the horses are a lot smarter and easier to train than the cows are. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see as he gets more and more into the equine industry. But uh, uh, he will be here in August for the Quarter Horse Youth World Championships. Uh, we will be sending you some information, but we're going to uh, host a, a welcome reception uh, as that will be the first major championships uh, held here in Oklahoma City since he will have taken over as executive vice president. His name is Craig Huffines, and we look forward to working with him. Um, as you have, have seen uh, a little bit of information about in 2016, we will once again host the Arabian Youth World Championships. That brings us up to eight world championship shows here in Oklahoma City, which just continues uh, to, to uh, solidify our position as the horse show capital of the world. Uh, I'm not well liked in certain circles with my peers, uh, those primarily being the cities that we're taking these shows away from. But uh, uh, as one of them said, you all are getting the shows because we failed to invest in ourselves. And so the investment that has been made at State Fair Park and continues to be, uh, not only continues to pay off for us, but continues to provide benefit uh, in the long term. Uh, in the tourism arena, we are entering what is typically our uh, largest season. Uh, this year, we're looking very forward to the uh, blockbuster event that will be held at the Museum of Art, the Fabergé exhibit. Uh, we think that that is going to be just an outstanding exhibit and is going to draw tremendous uh, response from around the region. Uh, with that being a fairly limited show, uh, Oklahoma City certainly will get a tremendous amount of respect and and attention from that. Uh, in our marketing and communications area, we continue to see great results uh, from a combination of things related to advertising, our own advertising program, but also we are already seeing some results as, uh, uh, because of the new program that the Chickasaw Nation has uh, initiated, the Adventure Road Program, which we have been invited to be a part of along with a number of the attractions, excuse me, here in Oklahoma City. Uh, if you have driven to the Dallas-Fort Worth area, uh, the Adventure Road Program owns just about every billboard along Interstate 35, and that's the objective, is to brand Interstate 35 from the uh, Texas border all the way to and through Oklahoma City uh, as the Adventure Road with things to do all along the way. Uh, we appreciate the Chickasaw Nation's involvement in that and their leadership in it and allowing us to partner with them along with a number of other institutions uh, to be able to, to uh, uh, to really spread our assets uh, further uh, in the promotion of Oklahoma City. Uh, I mentioned hotel tax just a minute ago. Uh, for the year, we are up about 4.5%, uh, about, uh, uh, which when you consider some of the things that have happened in the oil and gas industry, uh, some of the downsizing there, we have seen some hotel issues Related to that, uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things here is that because of the lack of hotels in some of the outlying areas of the state where there were rigs in production, uh, we had a lot of crews that were staying in Oklahoma City and commuting daily. And so some of our outlying hotels have seen uh, less business uh, as some of those rigs were laid down. But we continue to have a strong uh, hotel economy here in Oklahoma City uh, through the month of March, and this is, this is just a three-month report because this is on a calendar basis as opposed to a fiscal basis. Uh, but we are, uh, our demand for hotel rooms uh, is still positive. Uh, we have sold more rooms through the first three months of the year than we sold last year, which is a good sign, uh, particularly considering what I just said about the oil and gas industry and not having uh, Division I wrestling. Uh, we have added almost 80,000 hotel room nights to our inventory. That's a lot of room nights to absorb in a short period of time, particularly when you have a little bit of a downturn. Unfortunately, all of those rooms have been limited or select service rooms. 
which means hotels that don't have meeting space, that don't offer room service, that don't offer all the amenities that many of our travelers look for. And so uh, that does create some issues for us, uh, but we continue to work to, uh, to solve those problems and to meet those challenges uh, and continue to move forward. Um, we see a good year next year. Uh, our hotels have been conservative and have recommended that we, as they are doing, budget pretty flat uh, next year versus, and we're happy to do that. Uh, we certainly depend on their guidance uh, and their uh, knowledge as we look at some of the trends. That will not keep us from continuing to be aggressive uh, in moving forward next year with our promotion, with our advertising, uh, and with our solicitation of meetings and events. Um, we think that by the time we get into the second half of next fiscal year that we will begin to see some increases. Uh, we have things coming even this year, such as the Division II Women's College World Series, along with the uh, Division I Women's College World Series next year. And I may be getting that wrong. This year may be three, and next year we have two. But uh, long term is we hope to have Divisions I, II, and three of the, of the Women's College World Series played here, along with some other things. Uh, so, you know, there are uh, continued good activities that will produce uh, hotel room night stays, business and restaurants, uh, and other things that will be beneficial to the economy of Oklahoma City. Thank you all for your continued support and help, and we look forward to moving forward, uh, not only finishing out this year, but into next fiscal year. Be happy to answer any questions if you have any questions for Mike. Yeah, Ed. It was good to yes, see sir. General Electric had their annual shareholders meeting. Did that go okay? Uh, to the best of our knowledge, it did. Obviously, that's kind of a, a closed uh, issue, but uh, uh, we, we didn't get any negative comments uh, on, their, uh, on their stay here. Uh, they seem to be pretty happy. Uh, obviously, we're looking forward in a couple of weeks to the Southern, Reg or Southern Republican Leadership Conference, uh, another high-level, uh, high-impact conference that will be here. and uh, hope that they have the, the kind of quality stay that, uh, that we understand that GE had. And we're, you know, we continue trying to work to draw those kinds of things. Right. The, the, um, we got RFPs back on a convention center hotel, and it ranged from 70 million to 120 million, and Larry's talked about that we're gonna, we're gonna try and negotiate them down, and I pray that works. Let's say that, it, let's say that we end up there in the 70 to $120 million subsidy. Is that, and I understand the benefits of a convention center hotel. I mean, I always try and stay in them myself. Uh, but I don't have to pay 70 to 120 million. I mean, as a, as a city is trying to decide its priorities, do you think that's warranted? I mean, is that an investment we, that the, we should make with the public tax dollars on that scale? I would agree with Councilman McAtee, first and foremost, that we, we need to do everything we can do to minimize the investment that is required, but it's required. The long, you know, we're building a convention center not for the next five years or ten years, but for the next 50 years. And the only way that that facility is going to be as successful as it can be uh, is to have that headquarters hotel. Uh, 2007, we did an inner city visit to Denver, Colorado. And we heard that message very loudly and clearly from the folks in Denver. They had uh, built a convention center and did not build a convention center headquarters hotel. Uh, they worked for a number of years trying to get private development to come in and build one. They were not successful doing that. Uh, they finally made the decision that for the long-term success and, and future of Denver, they had to. They did. They have since that time expanded their convention center by 100% size. Their convention center is one of the busiest convention centers in the western United States, and there have been a number of additional hotels built adjacent to the convention center privately. So it was an investment that has returned a significant return to Denver in a number of different ways, and we've seen that in places around this, the country. Nashville is doing that right now. They opened a new convention center uh, about 18 months ago, I believe it was, uh, maybe two years now, but they built a hotel with that. Uh, they're now building a second hotel, you know, and it's because they already outgrew what they had started with in their initial hotel. You know, and 
again, they have made a decision to invest in their community, but to Councilman McAtee's point, they've been very, they've been very frugal in, in investing the minimum amount that they have to. You know, and uh, I think what we see here is there is a lot of interest in Oklahoma City. Um, we went to Salt Lake City last year on our inner city visit. They have gone through the same process. They got one response for their headquarters hotel, one. And they had a guaranteed $80 million in, uh, rebate or uh, investment in their RFP. We don't have any guaranteed in there. And we got seven responses. That says a lot in our industry about the level of interest that there is and the people that are watching to see what's going on in Oklahoma City. So, uh, you know, there's, there's still a lot of work to do uh, in that process. And I know the committee that is working on that will, uh, that it's a good group of folks that will do their due diligence, just like the hoteliers are, uh, to figure out what the best thing is to do. But when you look at the track record this city has in public-private development and the investments, um, there's not a lot of other cities in the country that have the track record that Oklahoma City has. So uh, I'm, I'm confident that our officials can do the right thing and continue to make smart investments in our future. I agree the private sector is not going to do it and it's going to require. So you, you've, you would feel that if it required that large of a subsidy, we'd get a return on investment. It would be worth. 70, 100, 120 million. Yes, sir. Okay. Can you, We've can seen you, that in other cities. Right. Can you, can you talk about potential financing options to the city to raise that 70 to 120 million? No, sir. No, the, no thought. Uh, there, there are, there have been probably 20 to 25 hotels built, headquarters hotels built over the last 20 years. I think I'm pretty safe to say that no two of them are the same. And there are intricacies in this type of financing that I don't understand. You know, that's why we have a, that's why we have a great track record here is we've got people in the city government that, that work with the city that provide information and leadership with the city that are very, very astute in this and have done a very nice job of getting us to where we need to be. Mike, thanks. Thank you, sir. May I ask one question yeah, sure. before you leave, Mike? Mike, do you know the new Expo Center that's being built out at the fairgrounds? Yes, sir. Is it, is the size, just speaking of the size, I'm, I understand hotels, restaurants, everything like that, but just the size, how does that compare with the Cox Center as far as space to meet in? Um, apples and oranges, but the, the basic answer to your question is in the Cox Center we have 100,000 square feet of exhibit space. We have 26,000 square feet of ballroom space and about 28,000 square feet of meeting space, smaller meeting rooms. So about 153, 154,000 square feet total. At the new Expo Center we have one big room that is 200,000 square feet. Yeah, and so it will be uh, a third larger in terms of gross square footage, but it's all one big room. <clears throat> well, let me, just a follow-up question. Could you have meetings in there? I know it's kind of designed for more along the lines of trade shows, like you bring in tractors and cars and things like that, but can you have a meeting? Are the acoustics uh, the type that you could have meetings and have people talk and things like that? Um, you should be able to have general session type meetings, yes. you know, where everybody is in one place at one time. The challenge is you don't have breakout space. So that if you have a meeting of 2,500, 3,000 people and then they break out into smaller groups of 150, you don't have any place to put them. And that's where you run into real challenges with that facility. You know, if you're, if you're looking at trying to hold meetings out there, uh, is, the, is it's not designed for conventions. Typical conventions, you will have a general session, uh, some type of plenary session, and then you will have breakouts for certain specialty topics. You may also have exhibits. That's why with the convention center, you have the different areas 
that are specifically designed for these diff the various types of activities. One of the other challenges with that is that the booking of the fairgrounds is so intensive that you're not going to have the month of September would be shot because of the fair, that the times where they've got existing shows out there and, and the area is booked to be difficult, a, a convention or somebody else wouldn't want to go in there during the quarter horse show or something along those lines. So there are, if you, if you take a look at that, the calendar of the fairgrounds is, is pretty full. Yeah, and, and the, cal the, the, I fully expect that the fairgrounds will begin to develop a booking policy similar to what the convention center has in terms of, of providing space for the highest level usage you know, in that space. They're not going to be getting rid of, of other spaces like the Cox Pavilion. You know, and so there, there will be some aspects of that that will allow multiple events. But uh, to Mr. Couch's point, their calendar is very, very full. And, and of course, part of the objective with this is that as we draw more horse shows, that there will be more activity in that new space with trade show components or other things similar to or that are ancillary to the horse shows. Uh, we recently had the Southern, um, the Southern Farm and Plains show or the Southern Farm Machinery show and we had the Quarter Horse Novice Championships at the same time. Well there's two shows that could be complementary. Yeah and so how do we, how do we get those two shows to work together to benefit both? David, can I ask you about the feedback? You're, you're, you talk, you, I guess you were at the convention center subcommittee meeting. Uh, yes. So, well, uh, all, I'm, all I know is just what I'm reading through social media. But when so they limited it to four sites, the, yes. And, but I'm reading about maybe taking part of the park as part of the convention center. Is that part of what's being considered, or where? What is happening with that? Well, that idea was proposed, uh, but nothing. Uh, I mean, it was just thrown out there as, as a possibility. What that could involve is the park remains the same as far as area, but it may not be a traditional grid, and I know that upsets engineers that we get off the square grid type. Uh, but it could be, you know, in all different designs, possibly. So that's on the table is taking part of the park. Oh, I wouldn't. For th I wouldn't say that's a a main focus at this point. But I think you could always have it as a possible alternative. Actually, is David, it, they took a vote on it. It was a split. Oh. It was a split vote, and they decided to add that in as a fifth consideration. I'm sorry, I had to leave early that day. So <laughs> okay. So so yes, they had the four that were presented, and those were approved. And then after uh, that, there was another motion made to oh. consider taking a part of the park and putting it in there, at least to evaluate that to see how that would work what, out. What part of the park? Well, the, the north part, some, some piece of the north park. And they, the, the focus clearly wasn't to limit the size of the park to make it smaller. It was whether we could adjust around and, and put the convention center in, in, in a part of the existing obtained park and then acquire some more park land to make the, the acreage hold. And, and so that was, a, that was a, not, not a unanimous vote on that, but that was a, a, a voted on to add that to the mix. So Populous is studying that. That's but, correct. And that was kind of my comment, you know, if we eliminated some of the streets, because let's say you've got the park and one of the proposed sites currently is across the street from the park. Well, could you just eliminate that street? And, and then there's really no distinction as to when the park begins and when whether it's a convention center or a hotel or an office building begins, it just kind of blends in. I think conceptually, it's kind of neat to at least think like that. Now, again, you're, I don't know. I, I, I just say, look at it yeah. and see if you can come up with a viable solution when you eliminate any restrictions such as you've got to stay on this block and you can't, you know, you can't vary from a square type design. What if you had a circular design or an oblong design or something? Yeah. Thank okay. you. For the record, pl planners like the grid, I think, as much, if not more, than engineers do. <laughs> well, you know, accountants kind of like it, too. We grow up on all those old <laughs> spreadsheets, and, and so there's some benefits to grids. All right, let's, let's go on to item uh, 12B on the city manager. Report. And next up is, is a, a, we're reporting out today on two council priorities, uh, maintain strong financial management. Craig Freeman is here to do that, and he'll be followed by a 
Aubrey Hammond, Trey, and Bob Tiener to uh, talk about promoting thriving neighborhoods. Craig? Thank you. Yes, one of the council's uh, priorities, one of the six priorities, is maintaining strong financial management. We're going to look at a few of the measures today or the indicators of progress towards achieving that goal of maintaining the strong financial management. And that begins with your leadership. It goes through our executive leaders and into every city, into every department. City employees throughout the, sit, throughout the city within each department actually participate and are part of maintaining strong financial management. We've taken the indicators and broken them into three basic categories. We look at external indicators, which are really indicators of the economic strength of the city, where we stand. Internal indicators reflect more upon our financial management. And then the outcomes that we measure look at the results of both the economic indicators as well as the financial management indicators. And the first one we're going to look at is an external measure. And I've just broken out this one of average weekly wages. The other two that we measure, there's quite a lag time in the time that they're reported. And so looking at average weekly wages, and even with this measure, there's some lag time. The last reporting period that we had that this goes through in 2014 was for the third quarter of 2014. So it's still showing the growth. We aren't seeing with what's reported here what the effect will be with the lower oil and gas prices and what effect that would have on weekly wages. The expectation is, and particularly with what we saw in last week's report with sales tax, is it's going to have some effect. And so the question really is going to be how much of effect it will have and how long that will, that will last. And so it's something that we're going to monitor very closely and be reporting back to you on. Um, but I think what we'll see that reflected in is within our sales tax and sales tax growth. Um, the next measure we're going to look at is our percentage of general fund budget that is from sales tax. So it's, it's what percent the sales tax is of our general fund revenues. How reliant are we on sales tax? And we all know that it's the primary source of revenue for us. But you can see here it's remained fairly stable at around 53%. And it's one that we want to, um, sales tax has been really good for us because of the strength of our economy, but we want to monitor and make sure that it's not continuing to increase and we're becoming overly reliant on the sales tax. We do try to make adjustments within other fees to ensure that the, uh, the fees that are charged are in line with the cost of the services that they're supporting. And so it's something that we monitor to try to keep that in balance, but it's just one that we need to evaluate, be aware of, and, and, and report on. We also make sure that this leads into the next indicator, but, but we also, because of the reliance on sales tax and the fact that it's tied so closely to the economy, is having a larger level of reserve is important. It's even more important. It's important in any city, but it's even more important here locally. And on this measure, we look at the comparison, and it shows the looking at our unbudgeted reserves in the general fund, and that's similar to a rainy day fund or like a savings account for the city for the excess uh, that we've built up um, of revenues uh, over expenditures over the years. And so we look at that by comparison to our policy. And our policy that's set by the council, uh, it changed back in 2011, and it sets a range of 8 to 15 percent. 15 percent, if we're at the top end of that range, still only represents about two, or about two months' worth of revenue for the city. So it's not a significant reserve. It's a large amount, but by comparison to the size of our budget, this year's budget is going to be a little over $400 million, around $440 million. And um, so it's, it's, not, it's not excessive, um, but, but it's prudent. It's a prudent level. And you can see that it's been over, for several years, we've been over the top end limit on our um, range for the policy. And for us, what we look at typically is bring back to the City Council an item for discussion, uh, to have a policy discussion about how you would use that excess. Typically, it is used for capital, and so that's something that we often do, and usually it's streets. Um, the thing that we'll have to do this year is balance that against, when we bring that back, is balance that against the uncertainty of the economy, because we're going to be in a better position you know, going into the budget, Doug's going to talk about that in a little bit when he presents the budget, but going into our budget with our assumptions now, if the revenues don't perform at the levels that we expect, we may have to use some fund balance to help us get through the year. And so it's just something that provides that protection for us to ensure that, in my mind, it ensures that we can be responsive to the economy rather than having to be reactive. And so it's really a strong position for us going into this year. The ex this is the expectation of the beginning of the year for 2016. It would be a little over 16 percent. These are just a couple of comments because, uh, that we get from our rating agencies. One of our other measures is maintaining our AAA bond rating. It's a very strong rating. It's the highest level of rating you can get, but very strong, particularly for a city our size. 
And, and for us, the, these comments here are important because one of them reflects upon the strength of our economy locally and how important that is to our bond rating. The other one reflects upon strong financial management. And you can see that it says the, the st financial management practices are strong and they're well embedded and likely sustainable. And that really means they recognize that this is something that's widespread, again, from the leadership of the council and the mayor through through the executive leadership throughout the city, that they see that it's spread throughout our organization. It's a part of our culture that even though staff may change and even elected officials change, that it's, it's likely, they expect that this is something that will continue for the city, so it's very important to us. A couple of the measures that we look at in relation to the bond rating compares our level of bonded debt compared to the net assessed value because that's the basis from which we repay those bonds. And so this is something that measures uh, compares that level of debt to the net assessed value. And you can see it stays around 115 to 12.5%. It will fluctuate some because of the fact that we try to keep our mill levy at an average of about 16%. Um, it should stay fairly constant for us. You can see it's ticked up the last couple of years to a little bit higher level, and a part of that is just because of the favorable interest rates has allowed us to sell more bonds. We've had very large bond sales in the last three years. And so that's the factor there, but it's something that we need to monitor. Um, right now, we're recognized by the rating agencies to have a moderate debt level, not a low debt level, but a moderate debt level, and so I think it's at a reasonable level, and obviously it keeps us at a level when compared with other factors that they include in their ratings, it keeps us at a level that we still achieve the AAA bond rating. Another issue that they look at is other long-term obligations, and this is a reflection of our Oklahoma City Employee Retirement System. And where we are in our funded position, you can see in 2013, the rating was at 101%. In the next couple of months, we'll have our new actuarial study coming out, and we'll see where we stand on that, but still should be at a very strong level at or near 100%. Um, and it's just an important factor of not only are we at that level, which when you compare to other pension systems through, you know, even some in the state, but throughout the country, it's a very, very strong level. It means that we've taken the measures and the steps to ensure that we can provide for these benefits into the future, but also the commitment of the council through an ordinance that says that we'll continue to pay the recommended contribution level every year. And so that's something that we're continuing and it's planned into the budget for next year. So some of the, one of the questions we get sometimes is what is the importance of AAA bond rating? And so these are just a couple of factors that we look at. One is the lowering borrowing, lower borrowing costs. As a result of lower borrowing costs, we can sell more bonds, complete more projects. Um, it also helps us to be able to be in a position to provide our support through moral obligations to other entities, to other city entities, other trusts to help with their bond rating. So it improves, uh, it doesn't improve their bond rating, it improves the rating um, their individual bond rating, but it improves the rating on an individual sale because the city's backing it. So if we put a, what's called a backstop on a bond, it helps because we're at AAA, that it helps them have an improved rating and will improve the rates at which they can borrow as well. And then it's also, it's an indication of financial health that these um, entities, when these rating agencies take a look at our finances and our economy, they're evaluating us from a long-term perspective. And, and so it, it's a good indicator for us of our long-term financial health. Last measure that we look at, and this is one that you look and you think, well, what does this have to do with strong financial management? And ultimately, the goal is, you know, that we want to manage our finances in a way that we have strong reserves, we can respond to downturns in the economy, that we're being prudent in the way that we're managing day to day, but ultimately, we have to be serving our citizens. And so that's why we use this. This is taken from our citizen survey. Um, we'll complete another one again this summer. And this is taken from the citizen survey, and you can see our rating has stayed around 66, 67 percent. Um, it did go up a little bit during the recession that was going on nationally. There was such bad news going on everywhere, and we really hadn't seen the effects of it yet. So we got a little bit higher ratings in that time. But it stayed fairly constant during this time. And when you think of 66 percent, it doesn't sound like it's a high rating. But when you compare that to other large cities throughout the nation, you can see that line below is the average uh, overall satisfaction for city services for other large cities. And so you can see where we stand by comparison, so it's much, much higher than the national average. So we want to keep an eye on that, too, because we don't want to restrain our finances so much that we don't serve our citizens. Um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, what would be the impact of if we let the ad valorem rate go to 18 percent? I mean, 18 mils. What would, how much money? Well, how much money? Mm -hmm. 
I would have to look at that. I'm not exactly sure how much. It's something that we're evaluating, especially looking at the 2017, right. the next bond issuance coming up, something we want to evaluate. So it would definitely provide additional funding that we would have for projects. The concern would be what we have to evaluate or compare that to is our debt levels. Right. Because it would drive our debt levels to a higher level that could affect our bond rating. Exactly. So we have to incorporate all of that. Yeah, that, that was going to be my next question, what the, what the uh, bond rating impact would be if we, we were at 18%. Most of the communities around us are, as I understand. It's 18 mills, yeah. yeah and there are 18 mills. Um, they're all over the place. There's not right. a visit number throughout the, the uh, surrounding communities. It was actually a policy discussion that was we had in, in the 07 bond issue, if you remember, I think it was right. Councilman Ryan was pushing for a little higher, higher right. level at that point. Right. Right. Well, it, it seems to me that you know we're going to be putting together the uh, bonds for 17 here, and the projects, or we're going to start talking about the projects, I would assume, in the next few months. And that is something we ought to talk about because it would, uh, while it, it might hurt the um, the bond rating, it might not though. I, it, uh, it would help. One thing is it would help uh, reduce the percentage dependence on sales tax if we did that. Would it not? I mean, that'd be additional revenue. It, it would be additional rev revenue that could go to capital projects. Right. So there well, could the, be the some pie chart you give us on dependence on on sales tax. I mean, on uh, all on revenues. Says 53 percent. Are, are you? Yeah, but that's I'm asking fund. you if you if that would affect that because that's a general fund and these wouldn't this would not affect the general fund. Right. So okay. property taxes okay. incorporated when the, in that comparison. We do look at a comparison. And I think there's one. I don't know. Remember if it's in Doug's presentation but, or not. If you look at all funds, which would include the other capital funds like the MAPS three right, sales yep. tax, would affect that. Right. Yeah. So it just it, it basically it, would mean you have a larger slice that's going towards capital projects. Well, there's a. But the general fund is not total. I mean, is the, uh, the yeah, well, the general fund is not totally devoid of capital projects. There are capital projects inside the general fund. It's very minimal. It's a very small amount. I mean, we do a transfer out to our capital improvements, like right. for some fleet replacement. It, it's right. small. It's very small by comparison. Doug, okay. Doug's got a slide on that in about ten minutes. What? Doug Dollar has a slide on that. In about okay. 10 minutes. All right. Okay. But it's definitely something that will be a policy discussion. We'll be evaluating the opportunities that are there and what implications it may have on our debt cover, our debt levels and what effect it could have on the bond rating as well right. as how much more funding it right. can provide for projects. So we'll be evaluating okay. that and have that for the policy discussion. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Craig. Next up is, I'm sorry. Next up is, is uh, to promote thriving neighborhoods. And we have a, a tag team here of Aubrey Hammontree. And Bob Tiener. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, we're going to be presenting together on promoting thriving neighborhoods. I know that the Planning Department and Development Services Department work hand in hand, and we have several key measures that tie back to the progress indicators on this for Council. Um, we're both going to be trading off back and forth because we do overlap quite a bit. I, I wanted to uh, put this on the screen for the benefit of the community and understanding how you've defined how important this uh, Council priority is and that vibrant and diverse neighborhoods are the building blocks of the great city. And how the city is going to continue to promote those strong neighborhoods is by looking at effective code enforcement, policing, support for neighborhood revitalization efforts, and through our strategic land use and development policies. And the indicators that council has asked the city to compile and report back on are a nice package because we're looking at physical conditions around our city to know to understand the parameters behind our neighborhoods and how they are formed and how they're growing. We have social dynamics that we have to look at because of course neighborhoods are composed of people. And we're looking at what the city itself can do to help neighborhoods thrive. The next slide shows several of the things that both the planning and development services departments contribute toward those goals in our services, our plans, our initiatives, and our programs. And we're going to be highlighting a few of those tied back to the progress indicators. First one being physical progress indicator of where people are living and moving. And so you've asked us to measure the percent of our population living within the inner loop, and the inner loop being kind of our traditional older neighborhood areas. And as we know that as our, as our growth of our city has has um, grown beyond those traditional neighborhood areas. We've seen a little bit of decline happen as new ho homes are developed and existing homes are then um, not kept up. So we're looking at where people are living. Go to the next slide and we can see 
the concentration of our density of our population on this map with the red and the orange areas being the more dense areas of the city. So you can see the concentration of the population is toward that inner loop and starting to spread beyond the inner loop. What that tells us is that we have areas within that that we would like to strengthen, we'd like to repopulate, and we'd like to rehabilitate. In the next slide, we know that that population in the inner loop area is steadily increasing. We've been measuring this for about 10 years now, and it's an average increase of a half a percent per year within the inner loop. That is a very healthy pace of redevelopment, something that we should be proud of uh, continuing. Another key factor is what type of housing we do have to support different people of different income ranges and different needs and configurations. And looking back to the past, we've predominantly been developing standard lot, single family homes. 67% of our housing stock exists with that. Smaller amount of small lot development or multifamily development or townhomes. It was important for us to understand as we were going through our new comprehensive planning process what the demand was and the expectation was for housing that's going to meet the needs of our community based on their, their demographics and their um, financial needs. And when we did this survey, it showed that we needed fewer large lot single family homes. We needed to provide more small lot single family homes, multifamily options, and specifically townhomes and condos, and at the right price point. So uh, the next slide shows that we are building a lot of that product, uh, especially in our downtown area. We have seen a very dramatic increase in downtown housing. These are those small lots, townhomes, condos. Um, the majority of that, about 95% of that, is rental product, which is another thing that people are tending to need and want as, as part of a full housing profile in Oklahoma City. Those, those housing units are being distributed throughout the downtown area into various neighborhoods, and within the next several years, we're going to see a dramatic increase of almost doubling the number of units by 2020 in downtown. In addition to focusing on trying to provide different housing types to fill in our city and, and provide places for people to live and quality environments for them to live, is we have several federal programs that pr provide funding to assist people in building new single-family homes. For example, our down payment assistance program built 62 homes for families last year, and our home program built 11 homes and funded those projects, bringing in about $2.1 million in sales value of those homes. We also help revitalize existing homes, not just build new ones. The housing rehabilitation program rehabilitated approximately 60 homes in those traditional neighborhood areas with an investment of $1.2 million. And so we understand that we have issues bigger than uh, new homes, existing homes, but uh, Bob is here to talk a little bit about what we're doing with abandoned homes. I'm gonna talk briefly about our abandoned building program. As you can see from this slide, there's strong public support to try to address abandoned buildings in the neighborhoods. Um, the next slide, this, these are obvious impacts of abandoned buildings in neighborhoods, the neighborhood appearance, uh, higher crime rates. Uh, you know, if that happens, then there's an increase in the need for city services, which just adds cost to our, us being able to provide them. Uh, I want to give you a little background. In December of 13, uh, development services was budgeted to create a vacant and abandoned building program. The program was intended to identify vacant and abandoned buildings throughout Oklahoma City and put them on a registry, charge the property owner a fee, and then try to create, try to come up with some options on how we would address those buildings and work with the property owners, work with planning, they have some programs. Well, in May of 2014, the state approved the Protect Property Rights Act, which forced us to amend our program a little bit. Basically, what that act did, it eliminated our ability to create a registry and charge a fee. Uh, it created a definition of what abandoned was. An abandoned building from this point on had to be declared unsecured or dilapidated by the council before it could be added as an abandoned building. But one thing that it did do for us, it gave us the ability to try to recoup uh, public service costs. When we have an abandoned building that has a fire or a police call, then we have an ability to bill that property owner. So in February 15, uh, well, December 15, I, I pre presented to the council my enhanced building program. 
Uh, basically, we did a, we're doing a proactive citywide property maintenance program. Um, we also established a, a way to create an abandoned property list and then compare that abandoned property list with any police and fire calls so we could track when we have a call, we can try to recoup that cost. Uh, through March 31st, we had 68 properties on the list. Um, the law requires us to bill quarterly, so we looked at the first quarter of this year, didn't have any matches, but I anticipate as the abandoned building list grows, we'll, we'll eventually get some uh, matches. In this last slide, this shows um, the year 2014, we averaged about 220 uh, property maintenance service calls a month. In January of 15, that number went up to over 1,200. Um, that number is a little misleading in that in, in the winter months, our reactive complaints are, are lower because we don't have the high grass and weed issues. So we're able to do few, a few more proactive uh, numbers. It would be interesting to see once we run this through the full year how those numbers work. Uh, one thing I will note on, on March 15, uh, the green bar there in, in February, there were under 200 of our work orders that were owner abated. In March, they, they more than doubled the number of owner abated. So that's a, a good sign. It's a little early to see, say that it's a trend, but hopefully, um, one thing I forgot to mention is when we uh, created the program, the council adopted a escalating fine program that allows us to find the first fine's $100, the second's $250, the third is $500. And we felt that that tool gave us the ability to try to get the property owner's attention. If they, you know, if a property owner works with us, uh, we won't write a citation. We'll, you know, as long as they're showing progress, we'll work with them. But, you know, if they don't show progress, we're going to write the citation. And uh, hopefully the escalating cost will uh, get their attention. Now I'm going to turn and it over. Was, and that was for only a Properties that have been declared abandoned, correct? Or is that for all? That's for any property that has any a property, property maintenance Got violation. It. I'm going to turn it over to Aubrey. She's going to talk about the abandoned building coalition. Thanks. Um, in addition to the program that the city has in addressing the abandoned buildings, we understand that it's a multi pronged approach. And therefore, we have been able to convene a group of people that represent different facets of the community, all interested and have a part of this issue into a coalition. Um, the purpose is to provide direction and to provide information, to make recommendations to council about things we can do together as a community and as, as a business community and a private community and municipal government in um, public-private collaboration around this issue. Um, this coalition is about 15 members. It just started meeting in April. Uh, they're still forming uh, some of their practices and procedures and looking at meeting either monthly or bi-monthly. They're composed of builders and real estate developers. There are people who are very versed in the legal aspects of this issue, policymakers, uh, several city department uh, representatives and neighborhood leaders and the school board and our county assessor on this group. So I think with that, we're going to be able to come back to council and make some good recommendations about programs, initiatives, projects that we can do to address it beyond the city's um, program. Um, another program I'd like to highlight, which I'm sure you all have heard about before, is Strong Neighborhoods Initiative. And I think this is a really good example of how those public, private, community initiatives can really focus in on an area and help strengthen neighborhoods. Um, the Strong Neighborhoods Initiative has been going on for several years now. It's received uh, $4 million in federal investment so far. We're concentrating on these three neighborhoods. Uh, they all happen to be in Northeast Oklahoma City, Classen 10 Pen, Classen's North Highland Park, Culbertson's East Highland. The goals of this are to help neighborhoods build capacity to be self-sustaining, deal with some of the existing housing issues and vacancies of properties, and provide some capital improvements to beautify and stabilize the neighborhoods. Uh, the next slide will show how all of these neighborhoods had vacant structures in them. And this is an issue that affects the quality and property values and crime, as Bob mentioned, in neighborhoods. So almost every single or every single street in these had at least one vacant or abandoned property. So these are some of the things that we're trying to do by using leveraging those uh, federal programs and federal funds to, to do infill housing on those lots, 
to help do housing rehabilitation and home buyer assistance in those areas. We're installing sidewalks, street trees, park amenities, removing hazardous trees, and um, helping support businesses in those areas. It's been a very successful program. So because of that, because we've had such great support in building the capacity of these neighborhoods, we're going to move on to your indicator about social indicators and how, how do our residents feel about their neighborhoods in Oklahoma City and how are they engaged and organized. One of the measures is the percent of residents that say their neighborhood's a great place to live, and another one is measuring the number of active neighborhood associations. So we started this survey back in 2013. The citizen survey asked that general question about would you say that your neighborhood is a great place to live? And 71% agreed or strongly agreed, and that is something to be very proud of. But what we really need to target is the 30% that don't feel like their neighborhoods are a great place to live. So in 2014, we expanded that question to kind of dig down into what areas we could focus in on. We asked the question again, and then we asked them to rank things like safety, appearance, property maintenance, the sense of community, amenities, and overall quality. Um, even though the overall satisfaction level had dropped from one year to the next, it still gives us an indication of some of those places that we can really strive to improve. And we do that through various means, different programs, plans, initiatives, and um, uh, um, other types of funds that we leverage, but we also have partners, and we do contract with Neighborhood Alliance, and I, I noticed that Neighborhood Alliance is here in good support, so I wanted to acknowledge Georgie Rasco and her great staff with Neighborhood Alliance. They do so much work in, in all of these aspects, like I just highlighted as our approach for strong neighborhoods and building capacity, helping do uh, training programs. The, the number of neighborhood associations that we have right now that, that we consider active neighborhood associations is 345. It grows. It grows by, on average, about five a year. And we can't discount the fact that every time we, we approve a new subdivision that has requirements for maintenance of common areas and open space, it triggers the requirement to form a homeowners association. So every year we see about 25 to 30 new homeowners association come online. So that's a big task to try to provide support and services to all of them. One thing that Neighborhood Alliance has been um, fortunate to receive is additional funding to uh, have a position that is now dedicated to concentrating on South Oklahoma City neighborhood capacity. And I believe she is here today, Anna. Thank you very much for coming. Um, the next slide goes into your indicator about what, the, what else the city can do to help promote thriving neighborhoods, and I'm going to let Bob walk you through that. I'm going to talk briefly about the programs that development services provide that, that help neighborhood stability and safety. Um, our Animal Welfare Division, as you remember from a month or so ago, we have a new superintendent. She's very active in social media. She has a lot of experience, and we're looking for some good things for her to tell us how to, how to make things better. And, uh, but we have different programs. Our, our main probably community program is our spade and neuter program. It allows any citizen in Oklahoma City that has a, a cat or a dog, they can make an appointment and have that procedure done for free. Uh, we pay for that using the part of our adoption fees from each each adoption goes into that program. It's been a very successful program. And one of the keys to reducing the number of animals that we take into the shelter is, a, is an active spade and neuter program. Um, outreach programs, uh, the staff there, they uh, attend neighborhood meetings. They talk to professional organizations. I know that our superintendent met with uh, a class in 10 pit neighborhood when they had some uh, safety issues with some dogs. and. Uh, so she's very active in that. She's, she talked to uh, Heritage College, their vet clinic. She met with a, the local veterinarians. I think it was the 28th of April. So she's, getting, she, she's trying her best to get our services out to the public so they understand what we can provide and how we can help them. It's been successful so far. Uh, the adoption events, this is another key component. Uh, the more animals that we can adopt out, the fewer that we have to euthanize. Uh, we do about 10 or 12 adoption events a month. Um, this year we were able to, to do two mega events, as we called them. That's multiple days with multiple partners. Uh, a slide I'll show you here in a minute. In December, we, it was a very successful event. We did it out at uh, the fairgrounds. Um, volunteer programs, uh, 
Volunteers are the key for us to keep the shelter running. Uh, they come out and they'll walk dogs, they'll do the laundry, they'll do whatever we need them to do that will keep, that way our staff doesn't have to do it. And you know, it, it, it really works. Uh, you know, we have large groups that come out and volunteer and work one day, they clean up the ground, something, but, but we also have people that come back every day. So it's been a very successful program and it's key for us to operate. Uh, this last one's a new program, the Animal Welfare Dis Disaster Brigade. Um, this is a result of some of our experiences from past weather events. Uh, when you have a storm, what we found out when people are taken out of their home for whatever reason, then the animals are too, and, and we get a lot of animals, you know, right after disasters. And what we've done, we've, we have a, over a thousand people that have signed up. And what they'll provide for us is they'll, they'll provide some temporary care for these animals so we can make sure and coordinate and get the animals back as quickly as possible. It's a program I hope we never have to use, but uh, our history indicates that we might have to. Uh, just briefly on the Development Center, uh, May is Building Safety Month. Uh, last year we, we partnered with uh, Lowe's and did an event there where we meet with the kids, bring the parents in and try to interact with them. This Saturday we have another event for 2015. I have a slide here in a minute to, to talk about. This is my probably my favorite slide I like to show because it's hard for me to believe that in July of seven we, we had a 25% live exit rate at the shelter. Uh, now in seven and a half years, that December number, that was after our mega event, uh, we got to 81%. Our target is 75%. Uh, this has been, in, we've been heading in the right direction. My new superintendent says that 75% should be no problem, that we'll exceed that. So I'm hopeful that she's right there. Uh, this next slide, uh, this is just pictures from last year's event. Um, you know, we do, we have some giveaways for the, for the children that attend, but really it allows our staff to interact with the parents and tell them how important it is to get permits how important it is for inspections. Um, you know, this isn't a police fire public safety, but building permits inspections is a key public safety because people where they live, we want them to be safe. And so uh, this is a good opportunity to reach out to people and, and just let them know. Uh, now I'm gonna talk about code enforcement a little bit. Um, we attend, Charles's staff attends one to two neighborhood association meetings really in the summer year round, but they're, they're more, seem to be more active in the summer. You know, just provide general information that we'll do a presentation, you know, whatever they need. Uh, neighborhood advisory groups, these are smaller groups that are a little more focused. A lot of times they're a group that go out and police their neighborhood and look for violations. We work with them to tell them, you know, what, how, how to identify violations and what to do and what the process is. Uh, we provide public service messages through, on Channel 20, uh, just another way to inform the neighborhoods, you know, what's uh, a violation, what's not a violation. Uh, we do two uh, citywide sign sweeps a year. We partner with uh, Public Works, Utilities, and Parks, and uh, our staff trains. They have employees out in the field that need to, you know, understand which signs are legal, which signs are not legal. We'll, we'll help work with them. We do these uh, sweeps, one in April, one in November. We try to follow the election cycle. That seems to be where we have the most signs, litter signs. Another program that's really successful is our Neighborhood Association sign contract. Uh, we meet with neighborhoods and, and they uh, contract with us and we teach them uh, where they can pick what type of signs or trash or, or illegally placed so they can work the, the sidewalks or the streets adjacent to their neighborhood. Councilman McAtee was a key component in getting this agreement done for us and uh, it's been a pretty successful program. Code Enforcement 101, this is a program, <coughs> excuse me, that Neighborhood Alliance put together. It, it allows uh, citizens to come and just find out about what city services are available. Uh, we have a code enforcement table there and uh, we answer questions, we'll give them a card, we, we provide whatever information they need. Um, I think last, this was two weeks ago, I think is when it was, and I know before it happened, there were over 200 neighborhood association 
contacts that we're going to attend. So it's a, it's a good way to get our, our story out there. Now I'm going to talk about, uh, these are two of the measures for st stable neighborhoods. Uh, this is code violations resolved voluntarily. Over the last five years, it's stayed pretty steady at 70%. We're actually up to 74%. Um, the key here is that, you know, for every, every violation that's resolved uh, voluntarily, we don't have to go through the citation and the municipal court process, or we don't have to hire a contractor to cut the grass or to secure a building. And it also results in those issues being resolved quicker. Uh, you know, it takes us, our process, some time, but if a property owner will go out there and cut his grass, then it, it's better for the neighborhood. Uh, you know, hopefully the more information we get to the neighborhoods, maybe we can move this number up a little bit, 80%. Um, this is a new measure uh, that was added this year. This shows our proactive inspections compared to our reactive cons inspections. Reactive inspections are the one, the complaints we get through the action center, the manager's office, council support, my office. Um, and as you can tell, the proactive numbers in July were right at 40%. And then once we started the program in January, we went up to 76%. The key thing to know here is that in the summer months, we have the high grass and weed. And this next slide maybe shows a little better. We have a, a lot of reactive complaints that the inspectors have to deal with. And so, you know, what we're going to try to do is we're going to increase our number of proactives in the winter months and late fall, early spring. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what this chart looks like in a year from now after we've been through this proactive building uh, program for a year. Now I'm going to turn it over to Aubrey to talk about Plan OKC. Thanks. Kind of like ping pong. Hope you don't have whiplash. Uh, we wanted to just end with these slides. This ties back to the statement in the description of promoting thriving neighborhoods to have a long-range strategic direction for Oklahoma City's growth. Um, I know you all are aware of the comprehensive planning process that we have been developing over the past several years. It's going to be coming forward through uh, Planning Commission and City Council for adoption in June and July. But what we're happy to say is that this comprehensive plan is kind of another one of those pieces and the many things that City does in and among its departments, but this was an effort to bring all departments together to really focus on what our core values and issues are in the community. The framework and the tool of this plan, really the backbone of it is to create diverse, stable, mixed income communities, revitalize and strengthen neighborhoods, and, and encourage preservation of existing neighborhoods and high quality new development as we guide growth. Uh, the major themes that are just woven all throughout this plan get back to so many of the different things that Council has expressed in their various priorities. Fixing what we have over building new, focusing on public safety, health and well-being, reversing underutilization, vacancy and abandonment, the quality of schools and education, and achieving thriving and attractive neighborhoods. So the policies in the plan are going to reinforce a lot of these initiatives that the city is already doing, help strengthen them, help develop strategies to keep pursuing these things. And so uh, with that, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. All right. Thank you so much. Next up, Doug Dollar is going to uh, introduce our proposed budget for 2015 and 2016. And this is just the prelim. You, everything you see here today, you're going to see again in some future meetings. We will have three public meetings on this, three public hearings mm -hmm. over the next five weeks, I guess. And uh, so we'll be in going into a lot more detail. And so we're just kind of laying out the premise for today and it's a proposed budget. Mm -hmm. And uh, Well, good morning, uh, uh, Council. And uh, we've, we're handing out the, the full copies of the book here. And I, I'd uh, just like to take a minute to uh, Thank my staff for all the work that they've done on it. Maybe if you guys could stand up back here. I've got uh, Brandy Sykes, Lakeisha Dunbar, Lindsey Baird, Lacey Kelly, uh, Joanna McSpadden is working the computer here. Clint uh, Putman and Jeff Mosher are distributing the books here. We've got a couple other folks that are out today, Susan Cruda, Christian York, and Erica Vandersypen. So I really appreciate all their work and, and dedication to put this together. So thank you all very much. Appreciate it. So as we look at the budget, the highlights uh, for the coming year are uh, that we're going to be adding uh, in the proposed budget. We have 72 additional positions. 
26 of those are in police. That's 20 uniform and six civilians. 21 additional fire positions. Again, that's 20 uh, uniform, one civilian. We've got 10 positions in utilities, six in public works, and then nine uh, spread across other departments. As we look at the, the dollars overall, we're looking at $1,248,000,000 uh, as our uh, total budget. That breaks down to $426,000,000 in the general fund, $230,000,000 for the other operating funds, and $590,900,000 for the non-operating funds. You know, we, we just had a presentation here on, on council priorities. This really is a piece of our whole uh, strategic planning process. Uh, we go through the uh, citizen survey each year that informs council priorities that you all developed last fall. That feeds into department strategic business plans that then uh, come forward through the budget process. And of course, throughout the year, we're collecting data, reporting on, on those measures, evaluating our programs, and, and making decisions on, on where we go forward. Uh, in light of that, we had the presentation today on uh, maintaining strong financial management and promoting thriving neighborhoods. The other priorities uh, for the council are provide a safe and secure community, develop a transportation system that works for all citizens, support high quality public education, and enhance recrea recreation opportunities and community wellness. And again, this year throughout the budget document, you'll see these icons uh, highlighting those areas that, that uh, reflect those council priorities. So as we turn to the driver of our budget, that's revenues, uh, as we look at the total budget, again, $1.248 billion. Uh, the biggest piece there is taxes. Uh, that's $595 million, or about 48% of the total. Uh, there was discussion about property tax. That's a piece of that. That's uh, about $82 million, or 6.5% of the total revenue comes from property tax. Uh, fees and charges include things like franchise fees, business licenses, building permits, ambulance membership fees, stormwater drainage fees, that's 14.2%. Uh, transfers in come from the public trust and provide operating costs for things like water, wastewater, solid waste, and airport services at 7%. Federal grants are a pretty small piece at 2.6% or $26 million. And fund balance represents the second largest source at 26.6%. That's $333 million. The MAPS-3 sales tax fund is the biggest piece of that at over $184 million. Other major sources are the MAPS-3 use tax at $24 million and the Capital Improvement Projects Fund at $51 million. So we focus so just hit that for a second. On MAPS 3, obviously, we're banking money yes. for the future projects. And so for all those projects to come in, and so that's why that fund balance is up there, because we're, we have other projects, significant projects yet to build. Yeah. As we look at the operating budget now, uh, that uh, focuses in a little bit tighter. Man, taxes become a little bit bigger piece of that, 58%. Uh, 657 million, I'm sorry, 657 million is the total. Taxes are 382 million, or 58 percent. Again, fees and charges become a big piece there. Uh, transfers in, same sort of thing from the trust. And you can see now uh, fund balance becomes a much smaller piece when we talk about operations. We're just looking at 1.8 percent of the budget. As we look at the general fund, we're at 426.5 million dollars is what we've got in the proposed budget. 64.3 uh, percent of that is taxes with the biggest piece, of course, being sales tax at 52.5% or $224 million. Uh, the other big uh, taxes there are use tax at $39.4 million or 9%. Uh, and then we've got other taxes that come in from the state uh, where we get a portion of those that are very small pieces like uh, commercial vehicle tax and alcohol beverage tax. Uh, franchise fees are 10.5% that come from the utility companies that pay us for the use of our rights of way. Fines total $27.3 million or 6.4 percent. Fees and charges are for building permits, administrative charges, those sorts of things, 16.8 percent. And then the other revenue includes uh, transfer from other funds, interest, and other very small pieces that are, are just uh, 2 percent of our total. So as you look at the expenditure side of the budget, again, we'll look at that big $1.2 billion budget. Uh, personal services make up 37 percent of that. Uh, capital outlays are the second largest at 31.6 percent, and then the other categories there. These are the categories that are defined in the Municipal Budget Act, the state law that governs how we adopt our budget. And uh, so you'll see these categories uh, throughout the expenditure section. As we look at the operating budget, now all of a sudden personal services become a much bigger piece here because, again, we don't have those major capital investments here. Um, and one of the things that happened back in, uh, in fiscal year 11, Council adopted a resolution 
stating its intent to keep personal services cost growth within revenue growth. And specifically, the resolution sought to keep personal services cost, gro cost growth in the operating funds below the average rate of revenue growth over the last five years in the general fund. And so for FY15, the five-year average in the general fund has been 5% uh, revenue growth, which seems really high, but we've had a 12% uh, back in 11 and 6% in 12. That's really raised that average growth to 5%. But overall, our, our personal services cost growth is projected to grow 3.2% in the proposed budget. So again, we're within those uh, ranges that were established in that resolution. As we look at the general fund, again, personal services at 73.1%, other services at 20.4% includes things like utilities, contracts for services, our payments to COTPA, chargebacks, those sorts of things. But this um, would be where that 4.5% on, on transfers would be the capital. That's correct. Part, part of the piece so that, that comes out of the capital of the general fund comes from white. Right. So we, that's a very small part of the general fund budget. We, we have five and a quarter million dollars budgeted as a transfer for capital. It shows as a transfer here, but it then is spent as capital in the CIP fund. When we take a look at the service areas within the uh, general fund budget, public safety is, of course, the majority at 63.8 percent. General government is 8.7 percent of the general fund, but that's because all of the general government functions are within the general fund. There aren't any in the operating funds like water, wastewater, those sorts of things. It's all uh, within the general fund. Public services, the second largest category at 17.9 percent. That includes public works, development services, and planning. And then finally, culture and recreation. The general fund is the Parks and Recreation Department and the cost for operating the Cox Convention Center in Chesapeake Arena. So as we, again, we look at the positions, uh, 4,743 is what we have uh, included in the proposed budget. That's a 1.5 percent increase over the current year. Um, we talked about those already. 47 of those are police and fire, uh, 10 utilities, 6 in public works. Um, as we look back, uh, you know, we've included here all the years since leading into the recession and coming back to that. So 2011 was our, our low point in recent years. And that's an increase of 417 positions that we've sent, experienced since uh, 2011. Of that, 144, 145 are uniform police positions, 55 are uniform firefighters, and an additional 25 civilian poli in, in police and fire. So that's 225 of the 417 have been added in police and fire since 2011. Um, other areas that uh, have seen significant increases include uh, 46 in utilities, 32 in public works, and 23 in development services. So a couple other highlights in the budget that I just want to touch on briefly. The, the impact of low oil prices on our economy are obviously something that's, that's uh, weighed heavily on this budget process. Russell Evans discussed that during his uh, economic forecast at the uh, workshop we had in February. Uh, and, and there's kind of two sides to this. Obviously, there's an, a negative impact on our sales tax. Um, we are projecting 1.95 percent growth in our sales tax for next year. Our 10-year average over the last 10 years is 3.7 percent. So obviously, it's lower than our average. If we had ex experienced, if we were projecting average growth, that'd be an additional 3.8 million dollars that would be available in the general fund next year. So obviously, there's a, an impact to that lower projected growth. On the plus side, we do expect to see some savings from lower fuel prices. Obviously, we're a, a, a large, we have a large fleet that uses a lot of gasoline, diesel, uh, and we expect to save about a million dollars next year because of those lower fuel prices in the general fund. Uh, one of the key drivers on our personal co personnel costs is health insurance. We're projecting a 6.4 percent increase in our average cost for health insurance to a budget of 12,305 per person. And next week, I'll take a little more time to kind of go into detail of how we get there. Yeah, we discussed that a little bit at the budget workshop of how did we get into it and, and how does that come about. So we're going to go into a little more detail on that next week. And as Mr. Couch mentioned, uh, overall, our budget goes up $112 million from last year, the overall budget, that $1.2 million. Of that, $91.7 million is from the MAPS-3 sales tax fund. Again, those funds have been banked over the last several years as the sales tax has come in, and now that those projects are getting into the construction phase, we're spending more of that money, and that's the biggest piece of that increase, $91 million out of our $112 million increase. So as we develop our budget each year, we follow the standards that are laid out in state law in the Municipal Budget Act, as well as the Government Finance Officers Association Distinguished Budget Award. 
um, and we've received that award uh, the last number of years. Uh, in Oklahoma, it's, it seems to me worth noting there's only five other jurisdictions that have received that award. That's Ardmore, Bartlesville, Norman, Tulsa, and Tulsa County, and Oklahoma City. That's, that's all that have received that award in the last year. So I might take just a minute uh, to just kind of flip through the budget book just to kind of orient you to where things are. Our tabs this year have got a little letters on them and that the page numbers correspond there. So a, section A is our introduction. That contains the transmittal letter from the city manager as well as uh, more detailed information on council priorities and the, and the key results that we're tracking there as well as kind of some general overview about the city. Section B is our financial summary. So you'll see on that very first page there, this is that consolidated overview that gets you to the $1,248,000,000 uh, total. Uh, we've got our descriptions of our revenue. I would point you to page B14 uh, is where we'd list in detail all the revenue sources for every fund, uh, where if you want to see what, uh, what we expect to get from each revenue source, that gives you all the detail there. And then we look at the expenditures. Uh, and then our positions by department on page B28. You'll see this is the departments present, but that gives you a nice summary of where our positions are throughout the organization. Section C is the uh, departmental budgets. Uh, this is what the departments will be presenting on, and so you'll see a very consistent format throughout for each department where we go through their organization, their issues, the strategies, and results that they uh, have projected for or that they have planned for next year, major changes by the department, their expenditures, and then we go through each line of business or division within the departments and uh, give information uh, on the expenses, positions, as well as the performance measures uh, in those. Section D is what we call our fund summaries. This is the official budget that will get adopted. This is following the format uh, that's in the uh, Municipal Budget Act again. And so for each fund that we're budgeting, you'll see three years worth of uh, revenues and expenses and how we plan to spend that by department and then by those uh, categories that the Municipal Budget Act uh, discusses, personal services, other services, supplies, et cetera. Section E is our capital budget that's really, again, informational about the major capital projects that we have projected for next year. And then finally, in F is our appendix that gives over our financial policies, our compliance uh, with our standard, with our, with our policies, and our glossary as well. And so, uh, finally, uh, as, as Mr. Couch mentioned, we've got uh, our presentations coming up over the next five weeks uh, from various city departments. We'll have opportunities for public comment during each of those meetings as well. And then adoption is scheduled for June 16th. And so a couple of things I think just to, to, to remember, if you're going to summarize what's going on here, it's, it, it's a unsettling year probably on revenue projections. It's a 1.95% budget or uh, increase on sales tax revenue is what we're projecting. We actually, it, it, it's, it's a half percent on top of that because there's a one-time increase due to how the state sales, uh, state tax commission is collecting them. So it, it, it really reflects a 2.45, but mm -hmm. half, of, a half percent of that is from the, the, the state tax commission. The other 1.95 is in anticipated sales tax growth. We just, it, it, we just really don't know what, what, what's out there. That being said, in the upcoming budget, we're able to add 26 police positions, 20 which are uniform as we go forward. We've added 21 fire positions, but those are only for a partial year, and those are mostly to accommodate a new southeast fire station that will not come on this fiscal year. It'll come on next fiscal or it won't come on this next fiscal year. It'll be the fiscal year after that, but we need to get them online and get them trained so they'll be ready so when that fire station is opened up. So we're not seeing the full cost of, 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 of the impact of those 21 police or uh, firefighters we're just seeing a partial year of that as we go, as we go forward. We've also, uh, we're able to add uh, a quarter of a million dollars for some additional nighttime transit service. And we've added another quarter of a million dollars for some additional street uh, materials so we can do more in the street area. Not a lot in either one, but we wanted to add something in that area. Councilman Griner has also asked me to take a look at park mowing he would like to do something, it's not in the budget, but we're going to look and see if there's something we can add to, to accommodate that, to come up with some type of increasing the frequency on some of our mowing, and to, whether that's contracted Me out or some way to do some increased frequency on that. So that's something we're going to be looking at here as we go forward over the next couple of and, weeks. And medians. And medians. Yes. Okay, and medians. And so that's just a, a very quick capsule. We just want to get it out to you. 
and we'll be going into much more detail over the next several weeks. Any other comments or questions from Council? How was the experiment with the goats eating the grass? I, I think that's working out really well. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get that report next week. <laughs> I don't think that'll work on Route 66. And, middle of Route 66. And I, I don't want to steal uh, Marsha Slaughter's thunder, but there's actually a proposal to in, increase the uh, goat uh, projects out at uh, Stanley Draper, I believe, is where they're looking at. So uh, obviously it's working out. Go ahead. Next. No. Uh, that's all we have on our city manager reports. Oh, well, we'd be happy to answer any questions about the quarterly investment report. Nothing to highlight. All right, we've come to the point for us. Thank you, Doug, for time for citizens to be heard. Uh, because of the hour, I will ask you, please, uh, as you come forward, uh, to give your name and your address and limit your comments to three minutes. Uh, with that being said, uh, first up, uh, we have Bill Elliott. Bill Elliott, 4418 Northwest 60th Street. Thanks for letting me talk today. The um, May is bicycle month, and we um, have several things I want to tell you about. The first is that uh, the last time that Oklahoma City did a master plan for transportation for bicycling was in 2008. And pleased to announce that this month we're starting a new master plan that will include not only bicycles, but now pedestrians. So um, we're real pleased that that's going to come about and expect to see a lot of great things that I can come back to the city council in the future to tell you about what we have planned for that. Uh, again, May is bicycle month. Uh, Bike to work day is May 15th. I hope that uh, all of you will consider riding your bike to uh, the celebration at the Myriad Gardens uh, on the 15th. Uh, Oklahoma City has 12 trained bicycle instructors, and we're real pleased to hear that uh, the plan Oklahoma City Planning Department is starting a, um, a campaign for bicycle safety, and we hope to also build a permanent bike safety course in the Boathouse District. So we'll be able to train both uh, youngsters and adults for bike safety. Uh, Oklahoma City, uh, the Oklahoma Bicycle Society is the uh, bike club for Oklahoma City. There's also a new uh, club in the city called Kittical Mass, uh, aimed towards uh, families with small children. Oklahoma City already has uh, 35 miles of bike and pedestrian trails. The new West River Trail opens June 13th. It'll be a big uh, grand opening, so I hope to see everybody out on, with, on your bicycles or walking for that. Uh, we already had 70 miles of bike routes. Uh, these are the roads that cars share with the bikes, and 62 more miles were recently added. Uh, National Bike Summit was recently held in, in Washington, D.C., and Mayor Cornette was a keynote speaker. Oklahoma Bike Summit will be November 13th and 14th in Stillwater. Hope you can come to that. And uh, I had told you earlier about the... Uh, Bicycle Friendly Community application. Uh, last August, we, uh, in the uh, Oklahoma City Planning Department submitted the application. November, Oklahoma City was awarded honorable mention. Uh, our next step is to work towards bronze. The following page are the suggested steps from that organization on how to get there. So I do thank you for your time. Thank you for coming, Bill, and thank you for your commitment to uh, improving the bicycling conditions in Oklahoma City. Uh, next up, Brenda Dentler. Good morning. Going on afternoon. Um, I am here to ask. Name and, yes. name and address, please, ma'am. I'm so sorry. Brenda Dentler, uh, 1421 North Libby, here in Oklahoma City. Um, I have a request. Um, I represent several different organizations that do a lot of benefits, raising fundraisers, different things. 
and it would be um, down bikers, abate, um, different types of organizations that are big fundraisers. They're associations, they're not clubs. Um, the, the one that I'd like to promote on May 9th, after my wedding ceremony, is the Wounded Warriors of Oklahoma. I've been denied the um, noise permit. It came to my attention um, two weeks ago that the noise, per, the noise in that area, that <clears throat> establishment, is something that's been a problem. And I understand that problem completely. My problem is, is that I can't make changes now. I can't move it to a better area. I can't move it to somewhere that is um, more, <clears throat> more allowing of the nature of the fundraiser. So um, what I understand is the memorial run two weeks ago caused a big problem. The big problem was there was a lot of complaints because of the noise surrounding this certain area, which is Council and um, 10th Avenue. Would be, the establishment is Marguerite Island. Um, the complaints I understand, but I can't do anything about. The, the memorial run was one of the largest runs that Oklahoma City has. They donated money, they participated, they showed their loyalty, they showed their respect, but unfortunately when people get excited and they have fun, it's loud. We came into this world yelling, we are gonna probably go out yelling, you know. So they do have a lot of noise. What I'm hearing today is wonderful. I love Lake Overholster, that's where I'm getting married. And then after that, the benefit starts. So we've asked no one bring presents, it's all for the run. So all I ask is to have that one violation, or not violation, that one permit um, accepted this one time because I can't move it. And if you say no, I understand. But the, vi but the permit is for the music. And under the law, it says that a noise violation can be airplanes, motorcycles, speedboats, it can be anything. So I don't understand why uh, music has to have a permit when all the motorcycles around that are causing the problem have no permits. I don't understand that little circle. Maybe it's just something that needs to be looked at. But my, my worry is that we're not gonna raise the money that we need to raise for the Wounded Warriors of Oklahoma. All right, well, th this is in Ward 1, and so uh, this, like she said, this is a area, th or the, there's been n numerous permits in the past Correct. that um, they have <clears throat> gone over time or, or what, whatever, the, whatever the issues are, and, and it seems like every time that we issue a, a noise permit to Margarita Island, we get it's violated. We get complaints, and it gets it, it, right. they don't adhere to what they agreed to do. And so, right. uh, in <clears throat> in the past, we've always known that that's probably what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. But usually, it's the 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 the, um, the event is for a good cause and a fundraiser, and so right. that's why we go. Okay, you know, even though we know, and so I think that uh, it's gotten to the point where we just. Have, have I understand that. That's what I have learned that in the past two weeks. And I understand completely, but I don't have control of what that establishment controls. I do have control over the music because I'm buying it. I'm paying for it. I want it outside. We're looking at rain. We may not even be outside. There may not be that many people show up, but whatever we can pull together to raise money for the Wounded Warriors of Oklahoma, I want to do. Yeah, well, and, and I think that, uh for the noise permit, it's only for amplified music. Right, right. So, I mean, and you can that still I have can music, control. Might, yeah. I can control that, though. See, because if I pay for it, and I said we're going to get in trouble if we go over this amount of time, and we're going to get in trouble if you are this loud. I've also, um, I know what dB uh, sound limitations are, and I do know that it's it's um, also measured by bar barometric pressure. So if we have clouds in the area, it's different. 
if their clouds are in the area, we have to stay below 60 dBs. If it's clear sky, we can go up to 70 legally. Um, they can shoot up to 120 without even realizing it, you know, on, and so I understand. Well, I mean, I, I think that this, I think the decision to deny it is the correct decision. I don't know if anybody disagrees. I mean, if you, uh, I, I would think that there would be other places that you uh, uh, could have this fund. Well, absolutely. But what I'm saying is it's too late to move it now. I mean, May 9th is Saturday. And I've been discussing this for the last two weeks, trying to find the correct people to talk to. And when I finally just, you know, figured out, I've, I've asked many questions. And everybody's sending me here. They sent me to the police station down at Hefner Division. I talked to the captain there. I talked to the major. They're the ones who told us to come up here. We came up here. I pleaded with Ms. Asbury out there, please let me talk to the council. And she said, well, Tuesday morning, you can have your chance. So, but unfortunately, we're running out of time. I can't just up and move it. It's already been advertised. It's been everything. So. Thank you for uh, coming Thanks. and sharing this with us, but uh, we're not able to do anything right now. Correct. So uh, That's OK. Thank you I much. just thank you for hearing me, and I hope that we have a great day anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Michael Hinton. I, there's Michael. Thank you, Your Honor and Council Members. My name is Michael Hinton, 333 Northwest 5th Street, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73102. I come today as a citizen to be heard to share a positive note and a salute regarding police officers and their service to this community. In the wake of recent violent protests and other things around cities in this country, against police officers, I think it is time that we, the citizen, citizenry, locally and nationally, launch a renaissance and rethinking of our police officers. I'm sure we all will agree that the duties of being a police officer is a tough job. It is tough physically, it is tough professionally, that too many of us take for granted. Police officers are challenged with situations in which we, as outsiders of law enforcement, need to ask ourselves, what would we do in the same situations that a police officer that is faced with? It is too often a thankless job being a police officer. I've been in the past few days out on the campaign and hoping others will join me to express personally to police officers, thank them for their service to this community. In the interest of time, I will state that I, a citizen to be heard, salute police officers of this community for their service. Philosophically, I look at it this way. This morning, it may be a police officer may give me a ticket. This afternoon, it might be that same police officer that may help save my life. Finally, in closing, I'd like to express my congratulations to Councilwoman Ms. Meg Selya for your reelection to Ward 6, and I have faith, ma'am, that you will continue to serve us quite well. And I thank you, folks, and Almighty God for this moment to be here. Thank you for coming, Mike. Randy Ulridge. I think Randy must have had to leave. He's the last uh, citizen we have uh, to be heard. With that, we are adjourned. <laughs>